Welcome to the 13th Summit of uh, Women Speakers of Parliament here in Vienna. Mr. President of the Australian National Council, Madam Director General of the United uh, Nations Office at Vienna, Mr. President of the IPU, Mr. Secretary General of the IPU, dear Speakers of Parliament, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I am honored to be opening the 13th Summit of Women Speakers of Parliament here in Vienna. I'd like to begin by thanking the Parliament of Austria for hosting this very special occasion that brings us all together. <clears throat> While many of our parliaments have learned to adapt to virtual settings, speaking to you here today reminds me of the unique and irreplaceable value of in-person gatherings. Finally, being in the company of fellow speakers of parliament, I feel the significance of what we have been through during the past year, year and a half of the pandemic and of the decisions we have had to make to come this far. Preparations for the summit and the speakers' conference was a months-long process comprising several virtual meetings of the preparatory committee involving representatives of parliaments from all over the world. I would like at this point to extend my and our gratitude to the IPU Secretariat for their good work and support preparing this summit. While we have achieved a lot to arrive at this point, the real work for us starts today. The theme of today's summit is women at the center from confronting the pandemic to preserving the achievements of gender responsive recovery. The outcomes of today's deliberations will contribute to the proceedings of the Fifth World Conference of Speakers of Parliament taking place tomorrow and Wednesday and the empowerment of uh, this gives us an opportunity to make gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls a priority on the agenda of all parliaments, especially as we recover from the pandemic. As many of you know, women have been a key strength in our collective confrontation of the pandemic, but this has largely gone unrecognized. The crucial role of women from all walks of life in pandemic response and recovery is something we want to recognize today. Due to lockdowns, women have been taking on a larger share of unpaid domestic care work. They do 2.6 times more unpaid care and domestic work than men. Women are also prominent on the front lines of the pandemic. They make up 70% of the world's health and social care workforce. In addition, more women than men are employed in the for informal sector, which holds up the economy in many developing countries. In many ways, we have seen that women are sacrificing their health and safety for the well-being of society, but they are not always adequately supported paid nor protected. As always, these gendered impacts are felt more harshly by women in difficult circumstances, those in situations of displacement, women with disabilities, young women, elderly women, and indigenous women. Thus, as leaders of parliament, we must act now to recognize the unique role of women. We must also determine how we can preserve our progress towards gender equality in recent decades through a gender-responsive recovery from the pandemic. The gendered impacts of the pandemic require gender-responsive actions. They also require strong and inclusive leadership. Women's leadership in decision-making is particularly important around times of crisis. For example, Greater gender equality in legislators and female-headed health agencies were associated with earlier adoption of stay-at-home orders during the pandemic. Earlier this year, the IPU released a publication on women in parliament. It revealed that the global proportion of women in parliament has reached a record 25% 0.5% and 20.9% of all speakers of parliament in the world are women. 
Even if we must aim towards an even better gender balance, more women than ever before are at the highest levels of political power. However, women's participation and leadership in politics has not been saved from the impact of COVID-19. Progress remains slow and in some cases has reversed. We have seen that COVID-19 disrupted parliamentary elections and created more obstacles for women running for office. Reports of online violence and harassment against women in politics have increased. Thus, as women speakers of parliament, we must ensure that a key element of gender equal recovery agenda is to ensure gender parity in political participation and leadership. Gender balanced parliaments translate to more gender responsive policies that can help with the holistic recovery from the pandemic. As leaders in parliament, we must strive to make our institutions gender sensitive by creating and enabling environment for all. We must legislate measures that level the playing field and open politics to women from diverse backgrounds. We must address the barriers that deter or limit gender equality, including gender-based discrimination, sexism and harassment. Our influence should also extend to the global community, especially to countries where women are in danger. We are hearing chilling reports of women's rights and freedoms in Afghanistan being threatened. While some have fled the country, women MPs and activists have stayed, risking their lives to protect the rights of women and girls. These individuals are calling on the international community for support, and it is our duty to answer the call. As the country aims to build a new future, we need to ensure women and girls retain access to health and education in order to prevent a lost generation of girls and young women. This is a great threat to gender equality and to the advancement of the country as a whole. Dear colleagues and friends, as we begin the exciting debates for today, keep in mind that no recovery agenda can succeed without going hand in hand with the gender equality agenda. Only then can we properly address and reflect the demands of society during this transformative time. Only then can we create more efficient, effective and legitimate polit political institutions that can withstand future crises. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to a fruitful debate. <laughs> Dear colleagues, I am pleased to give the floor to Mr. Wolfgang Sobotka, the president of the Austrian National Council, who is our gracious host for this event. Mr. Sobotka, the floor is yours. Sehr geehrte Präsidentin, Madam President, Speakers of Parliament, President Pacheco, Pacheco Director General Valli, President Sederfeld, and the Special Representative from the, from the UN, Patton, and the IPU Secretary General. The Austrian parliament before the pandemic uh, broke out was chosen to host the 13th Women's Summit, Women's Summit and the 5th World Conference of Speakers of Parliament. Austria in the past and has and in, even today is an ideal spot to have conferences and dialogue. Austria wants to support dialogue between nations and the country wants to live up to its role as a builder of bridges as it has in the past and will continue to do in the future. Now, because of the pandemic in this past year, we've only been able to meet virtually, but 
for parliaments, it's important to be able to meet face to face. Not just to get together, but also to have these side talk, side discussions. In this way, we can find a common path forward. And therefore, I am very pleased to see that you have taken the step to come to Vienna, despite the pandemic, despite the restrictions that unfortunately we are still facing, and despite the current environment that we're in. So I would like to say thank you very, from the bottom of my heart, to President Pacheco. We've been working on this for months to prepare this, this, ta this summit, and so thank you very much. I I would like to give my regards from our second president of our national council. She would have liked to be here today and is um, dealing with the long-term effects of COVID-19 and is currently undergoing rehabilitation. You can see how serious this disease is. President, the second president, de Boris, would like to give her deepest regards to the, our colleagues here today. And she's written and said that she really would have loved to be here with you today. And the next time she will definitely be with us. So the pandemic is not over. The effects are things that we're going to be feeling for a long time in the future. And parliaments will be talking about it for a long time in the future. We'll be talking about the social and the economic effects of it as, the as well as the political ones. There's a lot that we've learned from it, good things and bad things. But something that has is certainly very positive to come out of this is the fact that we can we've been able to develop a vaccine so quickly, and that's through global efforts. And able to, we've been able to distribute it out to people as well. And it's because the, world, the global community was able to pull together for this that it was possible. And that is a way that we will be able to tackle future problems as well. And that is why interparliamentary dialogue, dialogue between MPs, is indispensable. There's always pressing issues that need to be discussed and to make decisions about. An age old question, but it's still current, is gender equality. That is also the case in our parliaments. If you look back over the last hundred years, you can see that there's been some progress made. Here in Austria, Women didn't used to have the right to vote, but nowadays 40% of our MPs are women. But we still haven't reached parity to fully represent our society. And as has already been mentioned, about one quarter of MPs are women. And although there have been some setback setbacks, we are still taking steps forward. Now, as a member of the male gender, I can't really share your personal experiences or know about those, but I think it's also important for men to pay attention to this, to understand what is necessary and to understand why gender parity is necessary. That's especially true when it, when it comes to the issues that we face today. If we look then you can see about half of our female members of parliament have been threatened with violence or rape or death. And this is because of their, their sex. They are reduced to their appearance. They are subject to sexual harassment and if you look at that, then we know that there's still much to be done. And that is from the male part of society that that work needs to be done. That we have to do that. We can't just condemn it and stop it, but we have to say that it's our behavior, behavior from men, 
towards women. It, that is what needs to change. We need to look into the future and we need to work on these changes together and we need to come up with legislation to punish that type of behavior. We need to promote and protect women the world over. And that is one of our biggest tasks as parliamentarians. Now, we also need to work to counter violence against women and girls. And we need to pay credence to the fact that we need to, uh, uh, to offer protection to women and girls. And this is something that's already been mentioned, but we even see that inequality through the pandemic has, has, has increased, that 70% of care workers are women. Homeschooling, who did that in the pandemic? Who was taking care of the house? Who was taking over all of that responsibilities? All of those responsibilities, it was mostly women. And who was taking care of people at home? On, and who was, doing all, who was doing all of this work at home and therefore having less time to devote to their paid job? It's women. It's, so it is therefore up to us to stop this development in its tracks and then to also to undo it. And that despite the pandemic. Parliaments can take steps here. You know that the Istanbul Convention is something that not only has to be signed, but we have to live it. That means we have to, we have to work to prevent, we have to work to protect victims, we have to have effective punitive punishments for perpetrators. And that can really only happen if we change our behavior. So thank you for coming today. Thank you despite these major challenges for coming today. And we hope that you have fruitful discussions, that you take away great memories of Austria and Vienna, and that especially you have these discussions about equality in your parliaments. We're not going to tire of it, of, of having these discussions and living them as well. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Zaboska, for your important and inspiring message. Lastly, I give the floor to Mr. Duarte Pacheco, the president of the IPU and a member of parliament from Portugal. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Speaker Troen, Madam Chair of the Summit of the Women Speakers of Parliament, a word to our host, Speaker Sabotka. It's a pleasure to be here. Madam Director General of the United Nations Office in Vienna, dear Secretary General, our friend Martin Chundong, dear Speakers of Parliament, the, uh, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I am so glad to see you in person. I am, uh, believe me, a little bit tired of seeing many of you just online. To see the faces of you is completely different. We won the battle of the, of the virus and we are here. We wait so many times for the day to, uh, that is possible to meet again in person. And so here we are in one initiative of IPU to discuss one of the most important matters to the IPU, the gender equality, not just in our society, but also in politics. And so thank you so much for attending the meeting and uh, to travel from your own countries to Austria. And of course, a special word to all the efforts 
to the battle. It was a, <laughs> a battle that uh, but we won to organize the meeting. So thank you so much, Speaker Sobotka, for your welcome in your country, in your city. And uh, dear, dear friends, we struggled for nearby two years with uh, a pandemic. Affects people's health and well-being and affect the society and the economy. The, the crisis increase inequalities. And we saw and we know that increase also the gender gap in our societies. It happened, a, a crisis never is neutral. The same with this pandemic. And so, with all the lockdowns, many businesses disappear, and what the people that are more affected are women and girls. And we never should forget it. But also, we understand that in front line, in this battle, where women in hospitals, in all health centers, you have a special role to win this battle. Thank you so much for everything you have done to win this pandemic and to win the war against this virus. And so, of course, it's important your first uh, session, a tribute to our heroes. Yes, many women are real heroes and we should recognize it. And the debate is important because this way you will reflect the real world situation and uh, will understand and uh, how crucial were the role of women in our society. But if you pay a tribute to our heroes, it's important also the second item that we will discuss in your summit. Women in the post-pandemic recovery, preserving achievements, furthering process. Because we are happy, because we won the battle, but we, we need to think in our future. And we, it was so bad that many years of progress in gender equality disappeared in just two years. So we need to think in, in, to the front. We need to think to the future. And uh, we understand that if you represent women more than 50% of the population, if you were the majority in front line during this war, we have just 25% of women in parliaments. 25%. So we have a long way to have a clear parity in the representation. But also, we understand that the Parliament should keep their efforts in prov pro to preventing and addressing the violence against women that uh, happened during this pandemic. Just not in real, but only also in online space. And, of course, to create a more sensitive, more inclusive models of gender institutions in our societies. Because we have a lot of legislation that are not inclusive, and we still have, in many countries, laws that will discriminate women not just in labor, labor work, 
but also in many places. So we have a lot to do. This pandemic has shown us that it's possible to win if we work together. This pandemic showed to all of us that we should believe in multilateralism. That if we work alone, never had happened. The same in these issues. Just with a collaboration bet between all of us, just with uh, the work that we may do together, it will be possible to have progress in these issues, to have a more inclusive and gender society. But uh, we never forget that in some democracies, or better, in some countries, the pandemic was a, one excuse also to fight uh, and to create uh, measures against uh, the rules of democracy. And we should, we should say it clearly because we defend democracy always. And nowadays, a special word needs to be given to your colleagues to our colleagues in Afghanistan. Because we should defend all the parliamentarians and women parliamentarians elected in Af Afghanistan. Because we don't know exactly what will happen to all of them. And so, dear friends, colleagues, we may talk but we are not just common persons. You are speakers of parliaments. So you have a special role. You have some power. You have power in your hands to change the situation. That's why your role, your work is so important. Not just by words, by example, but by everything you can do in your own countries to have a more inclusive society this is what we wish that's why we are so committed in this uh, summit that's why we are here that's why we will work together strong with ipu dear friends i believe that from our meeting, from this meeting, we will have an agenda that we can transport to your own countries to achieve the targets we wish. I will wait for it. I look forward to your deliberations. I believe that you will work very strongly during these days. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. President, for your clear and uh, good uh, message. And we count on your continued support. Dear colleagues, let us now listen to Ms. Gada Fatih Ismail Vali, the Executive Director of the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime and the Director General of the United Nations Office in Vienna, who will be delivering her keynote address. Ms. Wally, the floor is yours. Mr. Stroin, uh, Speaker. Mr. Stroin, Speaker of the Parliament of Norway and the distinguished chair of this summit. Mr. Sobotka, President of the National Council of Austria. Mr. Pacheco, President of the Interparliamentary Union distinguished speakers and members of parliament, ladies and gentlemen. It is truly an honor to address the 13th Summit of Women Speakers of Parliament, and I'm very grateful for your invitation. You will find that our speeches are very similar, which means that our ideas are similar, that we know 
what needs to be done. And what we need to do is really walk the talk. Allow me to take a moment to celebrate and commend you and all those who have kept the world going throughout the pandemic, the women leaders and politicians who steered countries firmly and humanely while facing a new and unknown threat, the women who shouldered the burden of unpaid care work at home, the women who make up 70% of workers in vital health and social sectors, and the many other heroes, too numerous to name, both women and men, including the men who have supported women to lead and make their essential contributions. I believe women parliamentarians represent crucial agents for the progress we need, and I'm pleased that we can come together to discuss how we can keep women and their voices, rights, and contributions at the center in the post-pandemic recovery and beyond. To begin, let's start with numbers. Numbers matter. This year, on International Women's Day, we welcomed the highest ever number of women parliamentarians, with the global average rising to 25.5%, not nearly high enough, but still a needed improvement. Women parliamentarians are gaining the critical mass and the power to enlarge the space for action, to influence legislation, strengthen oversight, and create the conditions for further change and progress. In my own country, Egypt, women's representation in Egypt's parliament reached history highs after a constitutional amendment was approved in 2020 to allocate one quarter of seats in the House of Representatives to women. A further presidential decree appointing 20 women to the Senate doubled women's representation in the upper chamber. Still not enough. I'm a firm believer in affirmative action and quotas. Numbers matter, and we need to do more to get more women in parliaments governments and business and in leadership roles. As Ruth Bader Ginsburg has said, women belong in all places where decisions are being made. It shouldn't be that women are the exception. Numbers can also help us to understand our world by providing a snapshot of the challenges women are facing. And the data shows us that progress towards Sustainable Development Goal 5 on gender equality has stalled or fallen back in the pandemic. According to ILO, men will regain the jobs they lost, but 13 million women who worked in 2019 will be without employment in 2021. More women, and up to 92% in developing countries, are employed in the informal sector without social protection. Exclusion from formal social safety nets and public support in a pandemic has left many millions more vulnerable to exploitation. The pandemic has further exposed and worsened cruel inequalities, and severe vaccine inequity is perpetuating the crisis and hardship. Just 2% of the over 5 billion COVID vaccine doses administered globally have been given in Africa. 42 out of 54 African countries are off track to meet vaccination targets. For every 100 men aged 25 to 34 living in extreme poverty in 2021, there's an estimated 118 women. If we cannot stop new variants and new waves of the virus, COVID will continue to widen the gender and the poverty gap. Moreover, sheltering at home has not helped to shelter women from domestic violence, with reports of increased violence against women at a time when pandemic restrictions have reduced access to justice, aid, and services. Even before the current crisis, one in three women experienced different forms of violence in their lifetime. And I have to stop here and thank Mr. Sobotka for recognizing this and for mentioning the role of, women, of men in protecting women. Thank you. More than 80% of female homicide victims die at the hands of their intimate par partners. Numbers matter, but we must also remember that global averages do not give us the full picture. We need to dig deeper, to see and hear the true stories of women and girls in different places, to understand their specific challenges so we can provide meaningful support. And what we see in many parts of the world is that the basic security and human rights of women and girls are under threat. Even as we meet here, 
Women and girls in Afghanistan are facing daunting risks and an uncertain future. Millions of people have been displaced. 80% of the newly displaced are women and children. In recent conflicts in Africa, rape and sexual violence are being used as weapons of war, brutally destroying lives and tearing apart families and communities for generations. If we are serious about leaving no woman and no girl behind, we need countries to take concerted action across the UN pillars to provide security, to protect human rights, and to confront inequalities through a renewed commitment to achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. First and foremost, if we want more women in parliaments, in governments, and in business, we must empower girls from the moment they are born. Governments, communities, mothers and fathers need to give girls the opportunity to go to school, to get to school safely and without fear of harassment, to play sports and compete, to learn skills, to gain self-confidence and find their path in life. While this may sound basic and natural in many developed countries, it's not in less developed countries or in countries in conflict. Increased support is urgently needed, and here comes your role. 130 million girls worldwide were already out of school before the pandemic. And 11 million girls may not return to education after the disruption caused by the crisis. I therefore call on all parliamentarians to do more to advance girls' access to education and to advance girls' access to training. Second, Parliamentarians can promote greater justice in the COVID response and recovery by helping to ensure that relief packages meet the needs of women and girls, by prioritizing issues of safety and by tackling gender-based violence. Studies from the World Bank have shown that legislation protecting women from violence positively influences economic outcomes. There are more women owners of businesses where workplace sexual harassment laws exist. Legislation to protect women from gender-based violence and sexual harassment is associated with improvements in gender equality and a reduction in discrimination in the labor market. Advancing laws that protect and empower women in line with international commitments and UN conventions is good for men and women, and better for our economies and societies as a whole. Third, we need to take determined steps to strengthen implementation and enforcement in order to translate this legislation into effective practice. To do this, my office, the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, provides normative assistance to countries across our mandate areas of drugs, organized crime, corruption, and terrorism. Our work builds on the UN Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime and Corruption, the International Drug Control Conventions, and Legal Framework Against Terrorism, and the UN Standards and Norms on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice. UNODC legislative assistance is complemented by research and technical assistance, channeled through global, regional, and country programs, and a field presence covering 156 countries. Our office has collaborated closely with IPU to strengthen international cooperation and national responses based on shared legal frameworks. These efforts include our continuing initiative to support victims of terrorism, including victims of sexual gender-based violence. I am committed to elevating our partnership further still. Working together, we can enable and enhance the work of parliaments to tackle organized crime, illicit drugs and terrorism, and to promote rule of law and rights-based responses to crime prevention, criminal justice, and other challenges. Parliamentarians are also central to preventing and combating corruption and strengthening accountability in the management of public finances, a discussion UNODC will take forward at the ninth session of the Conference of the State Parties to the UN Convention Against Corruption in Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt in December 2021. Furthermore, UNODC and IPU are exploring a new and expanded framework to provide comprehensive and integrated assistance to parliamentarians. And we are pursuing enhanced cooperation with regional parliamentary assemblies as well. Fourth and finally, on a more personal note, I would like to speak about the role of women leaders and parliamentarians in changing the way women and girls view themselves in this world. 
In my work and in my personal experiences, I have seen how women can touch and change lives by acting as role models, by speaking up for each other, and by supporting other women. U.S. tennis player Serena Williams is a 23-time Grand Slam champion who understands that being excellent in competition does not mean bringing other women down. She said, and I quote, the success of every woman should be the inspiration to another. We should raise each other up. If women parliamentarians are to act as inspirations and catalysts for change, we need to see more women helping women to get elected and get inside parliaments. We need more women helping women within parliaments, bridging ideological divides to champion the legislation and priorities that matter more than politics. We need women to help women between parliaments across the world. Networks are essential conduits for learning, sharing know-how, and mentoring for everyone, and especially for women. In this regard, this summit and this week offer a timely and much needed platform for exchanging views and experiences and for uniting action for gender responsive global governance. And as Mr. Pacheco has eloquently said it, if we walk alone, we, walk, we, alone, we walk fast, but if we walk together, we walk farther. I also welcome the fact that the deliberations of the 13th Summit of Women Speakers of Parliament will feed into the Fifth World Conference starting tomorrow. Gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls on the agenda of all parliaments and parliamentarians, men and women. Gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls belong on the agenda of all parliaments and parliamentarians, men and women. Women need to support other women, and men need to do more to support women, to encourage and work with them, thereby enlarging the public and political space for women to act and lead with confidence for the benefit of all and leaving no one behind. Ladies and gentlemen, these past two years have brought unspeakable tragedy and continued suffering. They have shaken the foundations of our societies to their very core. At the same time, the pandemic has shown the value of women's leadership and the value of women's work. Throughout the crisis, women have kept hospitals and homes running and hopes alive. The world as we know it has changed forever and it's up to us to change it for the better. We need you. We need you, women speakers, women parliamentarians, legislators, leaders, community members, mentors and role models, now more than ever, for peace, people and planet. I look forward to joining forces with you to make our world safer, more resilient and more just. And I look forward to seeing you again at the next summit, which will only grow in size and strength as more women speakers and women parliamentarians join your ranks and take action. Thank you once again for inviting me and I wish you successful and impactful deliberations this week. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Waller, for your inspiring message. And uh, now we'd like to request for a group photo to document this very special day and everyone here present. And we will do it like this. Uh, colleagues, I will ask you to uh, stand up on the right side of your chair. And now I will also ask those of you who are here with me on the panel to join me in the room. And the photographer will be here on the stage, so it's easy to see where you should actually look. Thank you. 
No, 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 not ready, not ready. Please, all delegates in the back for the. Okay. Then I'll just introduce the, the coffee break. Uh, we, before we uh, dive into the lively debates, uh, we will be having a short 15-minute coffee break. So I hope we can be back here to continue the session in 15 minutes. Thank you. Back here. <laughs>
Se você me abraça, me embaraça, deixa sem graça com a sua manhã. Sinto o sol nascer, eu me derreter, me dissolver na sua presença. É que essa vida não dá pra ignorar o coração. Essa vida não dá pra se viver sem a paixão. Essa vida não dá pra se viver sem sedução. Thank you.
lies. Come closer. I want to talk to you. Me and you are finally here together. We've been playing this game for so, so long. Now it's time to show you how I really feel. I've chosen this special night and this special place. This place, the Bella Food. Yeah. Hello. Okay, dear colleague speakers, I would like you all to take your seats again. Okay, then I would like to say welcome back to uh, my colleague women speakers. Please take your seats and we will uh, continue. Okay, welcome back, dear uh, women speakers. Uh, could I please ask you to um, sit down? At this point, uh, we should have had an interesting insight from Ms. Favzia Kofi, the renowned Afghan politician and peace negotiator. Unfortunately, she did not manage to come to our summit today. But the good part is that she will come tomorrow and she will be here tomorrow and the day after. So it will be possible to hear her remarks and to talk to her. Okay, dear colleagues, it's now time to embark on the main part of our summit, the interactive debates. The first session is entitled 
Women in the pandemic, a tribute to everyday heroes. It aims to take stock, stock of, recognize and pay tribute to women from all walks of life who have been instrumental in confronting the COVID-19 pandemic. To get the ball rolling, we will be hearing some introductory remarks by Ms. Hedy Fry, a Canadian Member of Parliament and the Special Representative on Gender Issues at the Parliamentary Assembly of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE. Ms. Fry can't be with us in person today, but has recorded a video message for us. And can we now run the video, please? Dear colleagues, my name is Hedy Fry, and it's my pleasure to welcome you virtually to the 13th Summit of Women Speakers of Parliament and to this particular session, Women in the Pandemic, a tribute to everyday heroes. I am Special Representative on Gender Issues for the Parliamentary Assembly of the OSCE, and I've also served as Member of Parliament in Canada since 1993, becoming the oldest sitting Member of Parliament, female Member of Parliament in Canadian history. COVID pandemic actually showed us very clearly that women are vulnerable. And we knew it, we knew it intuitively, we knew it in many ways, but it really highlighted the vulnerability at the same time. It made it very clear that women are essential if our society is to function. They're essential uh, in every way. These are people who, who stood the ground, who stayed in precarious jobs, who actually worked when they were tired and depressed and, and were running the risk of catching COVID, who stayed the course, who did the everyday necessities to keep our society running. And so I say, let us pay tribute to those unsung heroes, those quiet people who just continue to do the things that they, we expect them to do. Let's just look at women in the healthcare sector, for instance. Uh, and these are the heroes I want us to celebrate first. They are the professional caregivers who work in the sector. Um, they are the doctors and the nurses and, and, and the, the therapists and all of the people who work in this sector as professional health caregivers. We also want to look at the women who work in the informal healthcare sector who aren't um, professionals in healthcare, but they're the women who provide the food, who work in the kitchen to ensure that the, 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 the place is clean, who work in janitorial service, who work in very low paying jobs while at the same time taking the risk of catching COVID passing on COVID and having to deal with all of that and then go home to their families at the end of the day. Female leaders in the self-care sector have highlighted the value of women's leadership. Consider, for example, the excellent work of Canada's chief medical officer and the head of South Korea's Center for Disease Control. Both of these are women and they are dealing with that daily stress and that daily burden of making sure that the healthcare system works to protect and to support citizens. And when we celebrate those women leaders, we must also acknowledge that women remain underrepresented in healthcare at the top of the food chain, at the decision making places where women can actually drive what we do to deal with this pandemic. So let's celebrate women in the healthcare sector. And then let's celebrate women and the unpaid care work that women had. And so they had to go to work, they had to come home, and they had to cook, and they had to take care of the kids, and they had to do all of those things. That and care, unpaid care work increased during the pandemic. The women who were able to work from the home also had to be school teachers. And so these are the heroes of what I'm talking about here. When we look at women in the high risk sectors, or the, uh, the employment sectors, uh, we want to pay tribute to the women in sectors that were severely impacted. The, these are the grocery sector, the retail sector, the tourism sector. These women lost their jobs. Um, through no fault of their own because the sectors closed down and they had to lock down because of this. And this is particularly troubling because women are at greater risk than men of being unable to support themselves during crises. And if their families experience a sudden loss of income during an economic downturn, they sometimes are the first ones to be the people who lose their jobs. And finally, uh, without being too self-serving, I want to celebrate the heroes of women in politics. 
In Canada, we know that women here got threatened immediately COVID began. For whatever reason, there was hate directed to these women, threats were given to them, threats of death, threats of life, um, you know, of, of altering their lives, threats to their families, because they were decision makers in Parliament in this time of crisis. There are women in positions of power who have been demonstrating the value and importance of their voices, and I want to add women journalists to this group. The presence of these female leaders increases the diversity of perspectives when we make decisions, and yet it has become precarious work for many of us now. And I want, so I want to acknowledge the work of journalists and parliamentarians, including women speakers of parliament, who played a critical role during the pandemic, who protected our democracies by ensuring that the public health responses that governments made were accountable, were transparent, were uh, to, had that oversight um, to make sure that, uh, that parliaments continue to work as well as they could. And finally, I want to say that why do we pay tribute? Tribute is about lauding people. It's about applauding them. It's about, you know, standing up and giving them a bow. But, you know, that's not good enough. For those of us in this room, we are parliamentarians. We make decisions. And so let us talk about how we put some teeth into all of these products that we're giving to the unsung heroes of the women. Let us get some plans in action. Let us include the voices of all women senior women, refugees, women of minority and racial background, that intersectionality of women who face very different burdens and very different struggles. Because women are not one simple group of people. We are made of so many different groups. And because the current crisis is evolving, because we know we're going to have another pandemic for the PC, it's critical that our governments collect disaggregated data to identify the women who face challenges, to get that gender sensitive um, understanding of what they faced during COVID and what they could face during another disaster. And so I want you to thank, to thank you for listening to me. Uh, I wish I could have been with you all today. It would have been wonderful to have all these women in the room or gathering force. But I know that you will have insightful discussions and I know that you will examine the important to topic of gender responsive recovery from the pandemic. And I just want to leave you with one last word, gender. It's not binary anymore. That's been recognized during COVID. And thank you again. Have a great seminar, great symposium. Come up with the solutions and let's hear women more. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Fry, for that inspiring message, one we can consider as we proceed with the debates. To moderate today's debates, I call on Ms. Christine Muttonen, international expert and managing partner of Central East Connect. Uh, Ms. Muttonen is also the former president of the Parliamentary Assembly of the OSCE. So welcome, dear Christine, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. Uh, a warm welcome from my side also to you all, for, to Vienna, to Austria, I'm very pleased to be able to moderate today. You know, ever since I was um, a little girl, I felt a certain imbalance between girls and boys, between men and women. Okay. And realizing that I knew that the fight for gender equality was on my flag forever. Be it working as a teacher at a higher technical college, mainly boys, so there was a lot of work to do, or be it as a member of parliament in Austria, or being as the president of the Parliamentary Assembly of the OEC. Today we are going to dive deep into the complexities of a gender equality. Before doing so, let me give you some information. Today's two debate sessions will follow an innovative format inspired by the Doha debates as a way of stimulating lively exchanges 
among the women speakers and presidents. The Doha debate format involves focusing on controversial motions, three for each session, with participants speaking in favor or against it. The list of motions to be debated has been provided in advance, and speakers have indicated the motions which they would like to contribute to through a sign-up forum. Their contributions shall be limited to three minutes, so three minutes, please. After which, some follow-up questions may be asked by myself, and then the floor is opened to you, dear speakers and presidents of parliaments, for comments and for questions. Speakers are invited to make uh, comments, spontaneous comments and contributions by answering the questions or making comments uh, on the motions being debated. Such additional contributions shall, shall be limited to one minute only. At the end of the debate, we will come to kind of conclusions or key findings and recommendations. We already heard in the introduction speeches that permanent work overload, pressure of home care, homeschooling, household duties, anxiety about the future. This is the daily situation for women during the crisis. However, and this is our first motion, women working on the front lines during the COVID-19 pandemic are more effective in providing care services than men in the same field. To discuss this topic, I'm pleased to have with us Ms. Claudia Abdallah de Zamora, Provisional President of the Senate of Argentina. Welcome and thank you for being with us. Ms. Uh, Favzia Zainal, the Speaker of the Council of Representatives in Bahrain, who will both speak in favor of the statements. Welcome. <laughs> we have Ms. Puan Mahrani, Speaker of the House of Representatives in Indonesia. Welcome. and Ms. Stephanie de Hoos, the President of the Senate in Belgium. And you both will be presenting slightly different views. Thank you very much. So we will start with uh, the first contribution, Ms. Abdallah de Zamora from Argentina. Please, uh, the floor is yours. You have three minutes. Okay, here or there? Here, here. Okay. okay, yes. Okay. Eh, señora moderadora, Christine Mouton, demás presidentes de parlamento, colegas parlamentarios. I am the president of uh, the Senate in Argentina. My name is Claudia Led Esma Abdala de Zamora. We have the conviction to strengthen international cooperation and solidarity. We are trying to uh, bring the world out of the crisis, but also to transform and improve the situation for women and children and girls who are in vulnerable economic situations. In the parliament, we are committed to working on multilateralism to generate debate and to aim to alleviate the situation for these women and girls. But COVID-19 has really been an obstacle and has really shown the different inequalities that exist in the world, within the parliaments as well. And the parliaments and governments have been trying to uh, face up to this. And in this situation of the pandemic, we really have to have this cooperation between different countries. And we have seen that we have really um, inequalities in um, achieving the vaccine. It has really highlighted deficiencies in this system 
And because we have to come to a global consensus, we, after this year of pandemic, we have gone through specific stages and all of us, I'm sure we have lost dear friends or family in this pandemic. There has been an increase in violence and discrimination against women and many of these inequalities are really uh, getting worse. The, um, we are seeing this discrimination specifically in specific groups and specific countries and we're also seeing great inequalities between men and women. The economies around the world are changing and they're changing at a great speed and the parliaments are not keeping up with this speed. So we really need to bring in new laws to meet these needs. Specifically taking into account the discriminations and the inequalities that women are facing within their families and within society. This is not a natural thing, it's not inevitable. We have a great political challenge before us. We need to transform these spaces where there are women and girls and we need to empower the capacities of all of us women. In this market, which is specifically excluding women, and uh, not just within in health, but also within uh, the government, in the security forces, education, services, I would say, I am sure about this, that women are essential at this moment of darkness for humanity. In Argentina, there are 70% of women uh, working, uh, women represent 70% of healthcare personnel. And it is, however, it is men who are carrying out many of the professional um, jobs within the healthcare. And this really shows this great divide uh, between men and women. And to finish up, I would like to say uh, we really need to go further in uh, representation of women and we need to make progress not only on an international and national levels, but we need to break down the barriers that are not allowing uh, women into uh, these diplomatic and parliamentary roles. And we need to stop this uh, inertia that we often see. And I would like to thank you all for inviting me to participate in this panel. And I believe that here we can really demand cooperation, a horizontal uh, cooperation with solidarity, which will help us all to fight against these inequalities and create more opportunities for women. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, you see, three minutes is very, is very but it's, thank you very much. Uh, we come uh, to you, Ms. Vasilia Zayal. Uh, would you, you want yes. to stand I there? I stand yes. respecting everybody. Okay, here. yes, please, you're here. Please. In the name of God, most merciful, most compassionate excellencies, uh, pre speakers of parliament, the woman has presented uh, a vision of giving, and this she's doing for the whole of humanity for in order to empower societies and to face uh, challenges. Because women in the front line uh, uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, shows uh, her leadership role in assuming responsibility in positions of uh, science and medicine and in volunteering for the best of mankind because women are there to face the challenges of the crisis and they were responsible because the world as a whole witnessed the efforts deployed by women uh, whether in nursing or uh, in uh, different uh, scientific laboratories or hospitals where we've seen 
mean women scientists, women doctors, women nurses who have really looked at the behavior and performance of this uh, very uh, mysterious uh, virus. And we as women have taken part in providing the remedy, providing the cure. And that was at the forefront of the battle, facing and fighting that pandemic. And we were superior in what we have done uh, with regards to men, especially if we look at the if we look at different indicators that show how women's performance sometimes have uh, shown, ha have performed better. And knowing that women represent 70% of the care workers in health sectors all over the world, namely in nursing, and women represent 65.8% uh, working in pharmacies. In my country, in the Kingdom of Bahrain, the Bahraini women has taken a very important position in a very a quick response in facing the COVID-19 pandemic. And the Bahraini woman has taken part in presenting a very advanced uh, Bahraini model where the woman has pushed sustainable development through her position and her presence in the front lines during the COVID-19 pandemic. And our presence there was at a 75% percentage because the percentage of women physicians is 66% in Bahrain, which is higher than the international average, which is 46%. And the percentage of Bahraini uh, nurses are 70%, 76%. And 80% of women are in executive positions and 69% in specialized positions, as well as 64% in uh, field work whenever we uh, dealt with uh, new cases, as well as 71% uh, of workers in laboratories and 78% in data collection. So looking at all these high percentages, looking at everything that the woman has presented uh, in the line of the COVID-19 pandemic, we, I say, we need to seriously look at the representation of women in decision-making positions, as well as uh, high leadership positions. So we need to look at that in an equitable and equal way when we talk about decision making at the national level as well as international level. And the United Nations has uh, uh, known the importance of that role. And thus there is the International Women's Day entitled this year, Women on the Front Lines in order to achieve a future that is more equal within the COVID-19 pandemic era. And in order to really acknowledge everything that the woman has done, women have done in order to have a better future, we also need to look at the recovery, uh, at the recovery uh, efforts, uh, and thus we say that women needs to be at an equal position and at an equal footing with men. And given everything that the woman has done we need to uh, say and we need to acknowledge that in order to get over the pandemic in a healthy manner, we need to empower women, we need to provide an enabling environment for women, an enabling environment that goes hand in hand with the challenges, whether at the social or family uh, levels. Thank you. We right away come to you, uh, Ms. Mahani. Please, the floor is yours. You have got your three minutes. Excellency, speakers of parliament, distinguished panelists, women have made significant contribution in fighting the pandemic. Without involvement of women, our response to pandemic is much lower. It was reported that women consist of 67% of frontline healthcare in 104 countries. Most of the female health workers serve as nurses or midwives globally. While in Indonesia, the proportion between male and female medical doctors are re relatively balanced. However, wo women still compose the majority of nurses nationally. I am on the view that gender equality can only be achieved with the participation and support of all elements of society. Both women and girls 
as well as women and boys equally. The Convention of the Elimination of Dis Discrimination Against Women has mandated that states take measures to eliminate gender stero stereotypes, to eliminate any prejudice and or practices that are based on the assumption of inferiority or superiority of either men or women. Assumption that women are better frontline workers could ins incite prejudice that men are not capable of doing equal work. What we need to emphasize at this time is that fighting pandemic should be carried out based on the capacity of each individual. What we also need is to have equal access between men and women in combating the virus. Given the nature of the pandemic, therefore, we need to work together based on col collaboration and solidarity. We do not need competition and superiority of men and women. Instead, we should redouble our, our effort to prevent discrimination against women amidst the pandemic. We need to stay united, otherwise virus will continue to spread. Together, we can defeat the virus and build the resilient world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Madam the host, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Dear colleagues, as we all know, the pandemic has had a huge impact on our societies and it will continue to do so. However, things would have been much worse without everyday heroics of mostly anonymous people. Most of them are women. They are indeed the true heroes of the fight against the pandemic. This is not merely an activist statement since there is abundant evidence to prove it. Unfortunately, women are also the biggest victims of the pandemic. While this is not the topic of the motion we are discussing today, restoring the damage done and taking appropriate measure to avoid a similar amount of female casualties in the future is of paramount importance. But let's get back to our subject, the fact that women were overrepresented on the front lines during the pandemic doesn't necessarily mean that they are better suited to do so. Statements like these carry a risk of confirming gender patterns like the female nurse. It would be better to ask ourselves why women are doing these crucial but often underpaid jobs and above all, why they are underpaid. Even the phenomenon of the widely acclaimed female leaders who were said to be doing a much better job than their male co colleagues during the pandemic strengthens a stereotype, albeit at another level. The cliche of the female crisis manager. We are not doing favors to women by pushing them towards the so-called glass cliff. This is, why I'm, this is why I am very wary of similar stereotypes. Although well-intentioned, they are always carrying risks. There is only one key principle, and that is equality. We should not be discussing about whether women or men are better to do, to, to, or better fitted to do job A, B, or C, but how we can guarantee that women have exactly the same opportunities and rewards as men at each stage of their education and their career. This should be a very rational, evidence-based discussion. Research shows that a lot of factors influence the success of organizations, policies, and societies. Gender equality is undeniably one of them. This means that we shouldn't be discussing about the fact whether men or women or better at certain jobs, but about the policies that are necessary to achieve full gender equality. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, now we move on to the floor for comments and questions. Are there any comments, questions from the floor? Yes, please. Good. <laughs> it's difficult with the masks nowadays, yes. Yeah, vielen herzlichen Dank, um, dass ich zwei 
Thank you very much for allowing me to ask two questions or making two comments. I would like to start with a basic comment uh, with regard to the introductory remarks. The title of this session is A Tribute to Everyday Heroes. The first tribute we have to pay is that all women, all human beings in our world have to have access to uh, vaccines and the fact uh, that this would be a particular sign of solidarity is wrong. 27 of the poorest countries haven't even received uh, or haven't even been able to vaccinate 1% of their population and I think it would be important to uh, give a clear signal at this conference uh, as regards a just access to these um, remedies. Uh, the WHO has announced that we still need 500 million vaccines. In my own country, vaccines are given back, so that's a huge inequality. We can only fight against this pandemic if we fight against it everywhere in the world, in sub-Saharan Africa and the global south, we have these huge inequalities. A second comment uh, as regards um, the remarks by my Belgian colleague, I would very much like to know what the situation is like in your country. It's true that uh, women in education, in care professions and so on were at the front. Uh, they gave a particular contribution, but they are earning less. So my question is, what about equal pay for equal work in your countries, Germany, has a 20% equal pay a pay gap uh, and it's clear that there's a lot we have to do. Thank you. Alessia Vasilenko, President of the IPU Bureau of Women's and Peace. Uh, thank you very much and thank you for this debate. But uh, I would like to actually look in closer at the motion which is, was being argued that uh, women are more effective and better at providing care than, uh, than men in the same field. But uh, this debate should look deeper as to why this happens. Uh, because actually both sexes, both men and women, have, uh, are equally effective. It's more about the roles that are attributed to men and women and the expectations that society actually has uh, of men and women. Women are better because they are expected to be better and because men are expected to step back in the caregiving, sec caregiving sector. Often because women are expected to be better, their employers do not value their efforts so much. And this leads to underpayment and a whole range of other inequalities because usually what do they say? That uh, it's natural for women to be caregivers, caretakers, thus it's the nature of women and it's not something that we should value more. Um, this debate, in my opinion, Thank should you. be about equal re reward for equal efforts and equal expectations and equal support at the end of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other comments from the floor? Yes, please. From Uganda. Cy oh, sorry, Cyprus first. I can't see here. From Cyprus, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think I will stand for the title as well and thank you for this excellent session that it's very, very important that we need to say that the title should be that not women are more effective, is that I totally agree that uh, we need to find the way exactly to see what all, all these problems behind this role, they are adequate to all these women. For example, is what uh, very correctly Mrs. Jose said about the paid less, the gender cap, or sometimes that they are working more that the, to prove that they are actually need to be there, they are good enough, or the fact that they need to deal with all these stereotypes. So, I strongly believe that our role is to safeguard equality, the same opportunities with radical reform, because we do are the legislators, if necessary, especially now that the COVID-19 reveals all these problems that they are there. So I believe that this session, this conference needs to give a strict and clear message and stigma about uh, towards that direction. So it's very crucial not us make 
let's say, a difference or a distinguish, uh, let's say, priority who is more effective. We deserve the, to have the same role, the appropriate role for everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, um, Madam Speaker from Madagascar, yes, please. Je vous remercie de m'avoir donné la parole. Thank you for giving me the floor. I would first of all like to congratulate you for organizing this summit. And I would also like to greet all the delegates that are here today. with regard to the issue of women on the front line fighting against COVID-19. I would also like to contribute and recognize or acknowledge the role of women and uh, their husbands who are there fighting with their wives and the wife of the President of the Republic who is committed to the struggle against this pandemic and particularly in the south of Madagascar where there is also not just COVID-19 but also famine to fight against. Thank you. Now we come uh, to Madame Sederfeld from the Parliamentary Assembly of the OEC. Thank you very much, um, Madam President. And I would also like to congratulate the panelists for their uh, speeches. It has been a very interesting to listen to you. My intervention is an other perspective of uh, the women in front line. We have seen during the pandemic that quite a lot of girls have been taken out from school to provide care back home, to take care about the family, about their brothers or maybe their parents, uh, their dad who have been sick. And these days, when the pandemic in some parts have gone down, in some parts gone up, those girls are not always actually quite often not back to school and this might affect the girls for the future that they will be less educated this means that it might be a risk that old habits like child marriage and so on could increase because the daughters the girls don't have an education and less possibility to be uh, to uh, earn the money and this is in some way related to the issue that they believe that women are more uh, effective more divided to take care about others and i would Thank like you. to have your comments on this uh, from the panel it would be very much appreciated thank you so much thank you very much thank you um now is there is someone who wants to Shortly, make a comment. Just one minute, please. Yes, thank you. I have an intervention to make, even though one minute is very short amid this COVID-19 crisis that we are facing. When we talked about men and women, it doesn't mean that we are um, distinguishing here between men and women, even though we have 47 women in different positions who are suffering from very harsh conditions that you are all aware of. But we are concentrating here on women because it's women who carry on her shoulders all the health and education issues of our family. In our experience in Bahrain, uh, we are equal with men in terms of salaries, as well as all sorts of premiums given to uh, women. Also, treatment, uh, vaccination, uh, tests are available for men and women uh, citizens 
uh, residents on Bahrain, uh, they all have these issues uh, free of charge. Even for the Bahrainis who are outside of Bahrain, they have these services uh, free of charge. They get them where they are. So uh, we are distinguished at this level, and I hope that uh, this experience will be generalized all over the world. Thank you. More comments? Yes, please. Yes. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Just please, one minute. We are a little okay. bit over time. I will try to keep it short. Um, the pay gap in Belgium now is about uh, 6%. So we're at the fourth place in the world. So we are not doing, uh, we're doing rather well. But uh, still we have some, some work to do. And we worked on a, on a, on a position paper on that in, uh, in the Senate in March. We did a lot of, uh, we said a lot of things that we, that has to be done. And one of them is, is of course, um, working at a legal framework uh, to do so is one part. And another part, and this is a very strong suggestion, but is that we need transparency on the wages, what men or women are earning. I think it's, transparency is a key to find out where the real uh, gaps are. I thank hope you. this was within a minute. Yes, thank <laughs> you. Perfect. Yes, yes Let please. Me speak in uh, my Bahasa. Uh, I don't know if we have a translation. Yeah, we, we have. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, di Indonesia, uh, terkait dengan pemerataan vaksin yang tadi disampaikan oleh uh, Madam uh, Claudia dari Germany, bahwa memang sa kami uh, sangat mendukung adanya pemerataan vaksin. No, no. With English. regards. Yeah, not translation. Yes. Yes. Yes, yes translation. Yes. Okay. Uh, with... Bahwa adanya pemerataan vaksin dan saat ini uh, Indonesia. Oh. If there is no. I will. I will translate consecutively. No translation so far. I will. I will translate consecutively after after the intervention. Then I will translate to English. Are you are going to translate afterwards? Yes, okay. please. Thank you. And then. Uh, <laughs> Dan uh, Indonesia dengan uh, 270 juta penduduk saat ini sudah um, uh, penduduknya sudah divaksin kurang lebih hampir 100 juta orang untuk shot yang pertama. Dan selanjutnya tentu saja dalam tahun ini kami akan memulai shot yang kedua. Dan tentu saja di Indonesia kami mendukung bahwa perempuan harus sama dengan laki-laki dalam menjalani uh, kehidupan di masa uh, pandemi COVID ini. With regards to the intervention or uh, b uh, given by the Speaker of the German uh, okay. Parliament. Uh, uh, we can't hear you. Okay. Sorry. Can, yeah. you hear, can you hear me now? With regards to the intervention given by the Speaker of the German uh, Parliament, Madame Roth, uh, about equal opportunity to access vaccine and treatment, we would like to report that currently, out of 270 million people in Indonesia, 100 million of them have uh, been given the first shot of the COVID-19 vaccine. And we have a very strong and a good plan to actually continue rolling out the vaccine campaign and complete the second shot within this year. And uh, also with regards to uh, equal opportunity for women and men, this is actually what we practice in Indonesia. We are given um, all, we, are, we have taken all measures to ensure that women are not disproportionately impacted during the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, ladies uh, and women speakers and presidents. Thank you very much. And you on the podium, thank you very much for the discussion. So we had a point, this provocative question really had a lot of reaction because uh, the question is how can we define the role of a hero? What is a hero? Uh, women and men should be equal, but there is needed transparency. We should know about the payment. And there was also the question, who are the heroes? Do we forget those people? who are those countries who didn't get the vaccine, uh, vaccine um, and we should discuss on these issues more. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please. Yes, it's <laughs> microphone. Uh, 
Okay, the microphone is taken. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Oops. So we have to change the microphones for the next session. You know, when, um, when I was thinking of going into politics, presenting myself in my constituency, one of the first questions that was asked me was, you are married, who is going to take care of your husband? I was rather astonished, I have to tell you. But, um, but fortunately, I didn't have to answer the question myself because another woman raised her hands and she said, well, I think he is old enough. <laughs> so you see, home care work, home care work was and still is considered to be a woman's task unpaid, of course. The question is, can we change it? Should we change it? And so we come to our, first, uh, to our second motion. Women's care work at home should be paid an hourly wage based on the national minimum wage. And I have here one speaker with me to discuss this topic. Ms. Inara Munice, the Speaker of Parliament from Latvia, who will speak in favor of this motion. Please, the three minutes, if possible. Thank you, thank you, Catherine. Uh, well, uh, my fellow colleagues, Madam Speakers, it's my great pleasure and honor to be here with you in this uh, Women Speakers Parliament today. And, uh, my special thanks is to Norway and Madame Tone for organizing the event and Catherine for chairing the session. Well, when I uh, decided to go into politics, no one asked me who will care about your family or husband. Well, in uh, my country, in Latvia, it's quite understandable that everyone is responsible, especially for the young generation for 30-year-old uh, couples, it's, it comes uh, without question, everyone. It means uh, both parents, parents are responsible for child care, for family, for housework, etc. Of course, it's not a question for my generation and older generations. Yes, there is a generation gap which divides uh, our society in uh, this issue. Uh, but uh, first of all, I'd like to start by thanking all women for their efforts during the pandemic and their care for their families and loved ones. Uh, what we have today, it's new normality. It's remote work, online education, well, and it uh, have put the resilience of women and children to the test. Over the past year and months, many of us have experienced a sense of guilt, even a sense of guilt for not always being able to do both, to be a loving mother and highly valued professionals, but we shouldn't feel that way. My fellow colleagues spoke about so-called women areas, women professions, uh, doctors, nurses, social workers, school teachers, and 
during pandemic, we constantly see that women are on front line uh, on the battle against COVID-19 pandemic. And women risk their lives to save lives. And I also thank teachers for the ability to adapt rapidly to digital environment, to teach digitally. Uh, well, and uh, however, we can and we must do more to support women. It becomes important for countries and organizations to ensure they create a culture of inclusivity, acceptance, culture of equity, intervening to address all kinds of bias. I'd like to tell about Latvia's experience, just in uh, some, well, very short and just some sentences. In the parliament of Latvia, we women uh, parliamentarians try to uh, focus on uh, our families, of, uh, to families with children, uh, how to help families, especially in this time, because there's a lot of pressure of women and families uh, uh, as well. And, uh, and Latvia is one of the countries facing a risk of depopulation, largely to very low birth rates. And therefore, assistance to families with children has always been the focus of our parliament. We decided that we uh, uh, raise all benefits related uh, to uh, child care related to help uh, the families uh, with uh, children for the next year. But this year, uh, we decided to uh, adopt uh, just exceptional measure to pay uh, some extra money, some extra allowances uh, for each child, which is uh, in, in family, okay. for so every child in family, family there's extra the money during, during the COVID time, and it was sure. just a one-off benefit, once. Thank you. Thank you. So we heard an example, an example from Latvia, so that uh, children being at home, at the, they got a, a special allowance, a special amount of money. Um, now we come uh, to the floor. I would like to have some comments uh, and, and uh, ask you for questions. If, you, if there are, please, we only have three comments and one minute each. Are there comments? Do you think that the example from Latvia is one countries should follow? Spain from Madam Speaker from Spain. Muchísimas, muchísimas. Thank you very much. I just wanted to make a brief comment on this motion, this second motion. I think there are two levels of discussion. On the one hand, the literality of the motion, which is considering work at home as a job, a real job, and therefore paid. But I think there's a second level that we must not forget, and which is the advancement of co-responsibility. It can't be that care should always be systematically, we said it in the previous motion, should fall on the shoulders of women. If it is a real job, it could be carried out by women, but also it must also be able to be carried out by men. I think that the real motion that is um, pending in most countries, perhaps there are some privileged countries uh, that have managed it already, is that really men should take care as much as women of work that has to be carried out at home. Thank you. Thank you very much. Madame Troyen. Thank you so much, and thank you for your interesting uh, message, uh, colleague Inyara. Um, I do agree with the, the last speaker, actually. Um, I'm a bit afraid that this would actually um, 
uh, in a way force more, more, more women to stay at home. I would like to encourage for, for social economic measures, for, for childcare, uh, making it possible for women actually to, to take part in, part in the workforce. So on the one hand, of course, uh, the work at home is important, but on the other hand, uh, paying it off would maybe uh, make more women stay at home and we need them in our workforce. So that's my, that's my mm -hmm. message, thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting point. Um, we come to Madam President from Peru. Buenos dias a todos. Good morning, everybody. Congratulations to everybody, the organizing committee. I'd like to make two points on this uh, motion, two key points. First of all, that we need to advance in um, equality between men and women. We know it's a problem um, that it's it's on an international level that we need to deal with this problem, not just in Peru. And the second point is that we have to have more women in parliaments. So the political arena that has developed in my country in today, we have uh, 130 uh, parliamentarians of which 140 of which 130 are women. And these reforms have only presented represented the presence of women in the parliament and we need to have public policies that recognize that this work in at home is paid for and this has to be brought up by our parliaments in order to be able to recognize acknowledge the work that women carry out at home um, and much more so in this time of pandemic and we have to recognize women's rights and that's why we have to work together with the parliament thank you very much comments. I'm very sorry. Do you have um, a, another comment for uh, the people? Yes, if you I'd, want? Like, I'd like Short to, one, one minute. to agree with Donna to saying that uh, it is essential for some countries to have uh, women back at uh, offices, at work, workplaces and so on. Uh, well, and uh, it's essential to divide. Uh, for instance, there could be a family with no children and family with seven or eight or ten children. Well, it means that uh, work care at family might be very different, might be very different, and how to measure it. Uh, Latvia's um, way or how we decide to help families, it's uh, according to how many uh, children uh, there are in the family. For instance, if there are five children, yeah. the allowances and benefits are much higher. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it means assistance to women. It means plus some extra money okay. to families. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we come to the end of this session. Um, we got this example from Latvia, where we see that uh, there is uh, much support, financial support uh, for families, but there, was, there were those questions which were asked, um, if this is a paid job, paid job, so men should do it as well. And on the other hand, there was this question, which is, I think, also very important, we need women in the workforce. So how can we deal with this? So we have here two sides where we, I think, still have to work a lot on this topic. Thank you very much for this interesting uh, debate. Thank you. Thank you very much. So. We wait for the next speakers and their microphones. Hello. Hello, nice to meet you. <laughs> it's difficult. Um.
Hello. Hello. Thank you. Yes, yes, fresh. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. So, um, distinguished speakers, we come to motion number three. When um, we talk about gender equality, when we talk about poverty, eradication, economic growth, we also have to talk about social protection. And this leads us to our motion number three, which says, today, 60% of women are not covered, 60% of women are not covered by any type of social protection. By 2030, universal and gender responsive social protection systems will be available for everyone. So, um, to discuss this interesting uh, topic, we are very happy to have with us Ms. Uh, Meritzel Baté, the President of the Congress of Deputies in Spain, who will speak in favor of the motion. Welcome. Thank you very much. We have uh, Ms. Moriana Cristo, Speaker of the House of Representatives of Bosnia-Herzegovina. Welcome. Hola. And we have uh, Ms. Lesia Vasilenko, the President of the IPU Forum of Women Parliamentarians, and they both will contribute with slightly different views. So may I start with you, Rampati? Thank you. Three minutes, please. Yes, thank you. I'm going to try. Yes. <laughs> pues. Good morning, everybody. As I only have three minutes, I will go straight to the point. We're talking about social protection here. I don't think there's more discrimination than the exclusion of women from pensions and social security. If this 60% of exclusion, if we add this to um, the less time that people are paying into the system and the benefits they get from this, we can see that these inequalities expressed across the board. They are devastating inequalities in terms of independence, in terms of development and in terms of poverty and exclusion. We're seeing more women in these groups that are being excluded. And it is affecting all countries, um, but particularly those that have uh, less development. But we are really seeing it all in all of the countries and particularly it is being particularly aggravated during the crisis as we have seen during the pandemic because the crisis isn't ex uh, affecting everyone in the same way one example is the researchers and sci scientists women researchers and scientists who have published a lot less uh, a lot fewer articles than their men male colleagues and is this because they are um, less uh, prestigious or um, they have less ability? No, it's because they have to be looking after their family or taking care of the um, home education, etc. And we are seeing this particularly as uh, Madame Frey said in her in her first intervention, it's particularly affecting uh, immigrants, old, older women, um, etc. And this is something that has to change from the political and social uh, laws in our countries. If we want a more equal society in by 2030, we need to have a more fair society now. We have to um, change aspects in access to 
education and to the labour market. Education is the key word here. Secondly, we need compensation for the most vulnerable groups. And thirdly, we need to make progress in the universal uh, coverage system and have uh, progressive changes. In Spain, we have experience in all of these aspects and we're looking to uh, collaborate with other parliaments to promote their development. We have a long road ahead of us and we would like to do this together, committed with all other countries to achieve a real and effective equality between women and men. This is a, an essential right that we've been fighting for for centuries and we still have a lot to do on this. Thank you very much to you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. May I ask you for your intervention, please? Poštovane predsjednice parlamenta, dame i gospodo, uvaženi sudionici ove konferencije, sve vas skupa srdačno pozdravljam. Ravnopravnost žena i muškaraca predstavlja standard koji je zaštićen praktično svakim obvezujućim pravnim instrumentom o temeljnim ljudskim pravima. Također dva međunarodna sporazuma. Ok? No. Translation. Shall we, shall we, is it possible that you, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. I don't know. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, okay. Voila. Voila. Because of a technical problem, no, technical. we, we no. switch uh, those two, and I ask now uh, uh, Ms. Vasilenko, please take the floor. Okay, hopefully the technical difficulties will, will be sorted out. So, honorable speakers, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it is, it is okay? such a blessing that we have the opportunity to gather here today in person and finally discuss the burning issues that plague all our societies today. Gender inequality is, of course, one such plague that deters fair, just and sustainable development ac across the whole world. 
As today we pay tribute to the women heroes who have contributed tremendous efforts to combating the pandemic, we realize some very sad statistics. Women make up 70% of the caregivers who have fought at the front lines of the COVID-19. But 60% of women remain today without due support, without due social support, social care, and are thrown overboard the social security train. Something's not right in this formula. The workload and responsibility grows as the support and acknowledgement decreases. However, social policies that are targeted solely and purely at women will never provide a solution to this problem. If anything, such policies risk only to make the situation worse. What the world needs today is, in fact, an equality model based on universal gender responsive social policies. It is important for all of us to note the immense role culture plays on lawmaking. And at the same time, it is also important that all of us acknowledge the role parliaments have on influencing cu cultural transformations. I'd, I'd like for us to look today at the expectations we have of men and women in all of our societies. The root of the issues goes back to how we understand the roles of mothers and fathers in our families, the language we use. That gender pay gap we often discuss and talk about, that is the result of the different roles that are attributed to men and women, and different expectations, of course, that we have. In situations where a woman and a man are both working full time, a woman is more likely to spend more time at home with childcare and household activities, leaving less time for professional development. This, of course, impacts the likelihood of a mother getting promoted and, at the end of the day, the likelihood of getting a higher salary and influences the divergence that we see today between the pay of men and women. Some fellow countries have actually found a solution. For example, Iceland, Sweden, Norway, they have legislation that encourages not only mothers to stay at home and take care of children, but also fathers. They make it a use it or lose it conditions for fathers to take leave, putting pressure on men to take up more active roles in childcare and household matters. This universal parental leave policy had significant impact on decreasing the pay gap. In order for such policies to find their place and acceptance in societies, the issue must be constantly addressed, discussed and debated in schools, in kindergartens, universities, across the educational systems, but also in the media. The media play a key role in reframing the role women play in family and economic life. Private and national media should revisit the contents they distribute, and so should advertisers. And it is up to parliaments, up to all of us, to reach out to newsmakers, influencers, educators with a simple message. Women's equality in the workplace cannot be real without men's equality at home. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I leave you with this to think about. Thank you very much. Thank you. So um, is the problem solved so far? Not yet. So we, do we have somebody to translate? Yes. Uh, OK. We, we s just see one sentence. Okay. Još jedna moja isprika, ali ću nastaviti tamo gdje sam stala. Također dva međunarodna sporazuma kao i Evropska konvencija o zaštiti ljudskih prava i temeljnih sloboda. No, no, I'm sorry, it doesn't. It doesn't no. work. It doesn't work. So, uh, it, I think we get some help from your assistant. Is it possible for you? So, we will get help from, from the assistant. Yeah. 
Thank you. Takođe, dva međunarodna sporazuma kao i Evropska konvencija o zaštiti ljudskih prava i temeljnih sloboda štite ravnopravno uživanje prava kao temeljni princip ostvarivanja svih ljudskih prava. Dear ladies and gentlemen, female presidents, I thank you all. Equality between women and men is a standard that's protected virtually by every binding legal instrument on human rights. Also, two international agreements, as well as European Convention on the Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms, protect the equal enjoyment of rights as a fundamental principle of the exercise of all human rights. Kada govorimo o bilo kakvom obliku diskriminacije, bilo da se radi o diskriminaciji po osnovu spola, boje kože, nacionalne pripadnosti i drugo, moramo imati u vidu određene povijesne činjenice kao i empirijske pokazatelje promatrano u jednom dužem vremenskom razdoblju. When we talk about any form of discrimination, whether it's discrimination based on gender, color of skill, ethnicity, etc., we must bear in mind certain historical facts as well as empirical indicators observed over a longer period of time. Stoga i sam sustav socijalne zaštite na koji Bosna i Hercegovina, slično kao i ostale zemlje regije, troši otprilike četvrtinu svoga BDP-a u najvećim dijelom kroz doprinose za mirovinsko i zdravstveno osiguranje ima određene manjkavosti. Therefore, the social protection system itself on which Bosnia and Herzegovina, like other countries in the region, spends about a quarter of its GDP, mostly through pension and health insurance contributions, has certain shortcomings. Govoreći konkretno i o ovoj današnjoj temi, da relativno veliki postotak žena nije obuhvaćen nikakvom vrstom socijalne zaštite, razlog se može naći i u povijesnoj činjenici posebno u postsocijalističkim društvima, da je žena imala status pomažućeg neplaćenog člana kućanstva, a posebno u ruralnim dijelovima zemlje. Nadalje, debalans na tržištu rada gdje potraga za zaposlenjem postaje problem kojim su posebno pogođene žene. Speaking specifically on this topic today, that is a large, large percentage of women uh, are not covered by any kind of social protection. The reason can be found in the historical fact, especially in post-socialist societies, that women have had the status of unpaid supportive household member, especially in rural parts. Naravno, razlog nije nedostatak sposobnosti kod žena. Naprotiv, žene su u posljednjih godina širom Europe svojim radom i trudom stekle prednost u obrazovanju u odnosu na muškarce. Usprko s tome, kada promatramo statističke podatke o zaposlenosti žene, češće ostaju nezaposlene, možda objašnjenje leži u činjenici da žene još uvijek rade slabije plaćene poslove, da su nedovoljno zastupljene u višim hierarhijskim razinama ili da češće ograničavaju svoje radno vrijeme kako bi odgajale djecu i sl. Ekonomski izazov na vremena, kao što je i ovo današnje u kojem smo suočeni s pandemijom COVID-19, plodno su tlo za diskriminaciju u području rada i zapošljavanja, kao i društvu općenito. Naturally, the reason is not the lack of skills among women. On the contrary, throughout women, Europe, women have over the recent years gained an advantage in education over men through their work and efforts. Nevertheless, when we take a look at employment statistics, women are more likely to remain unemployed. Perhaps the explanation lies in the fact that women still do lower paid jobs. Uh, they are underrepresented higher up to the hierarchical you know, levels or more, which often limits their working hours to raise children, etc. Uh, in economically challenging times such as these, today in which we are facing the COVID-19 pandemic, are fertile ground for discrimination in the field of labor and employment as well as in society in general. 
S aspekta nas zastupnica kao predstavnica zakonodavne vlasti, aktivnosti na povećanju socijalne zašte kroz poboljšanje položaja žena na tržištu rada moraju biti usmjerene na unapređenje zakonskih rješenja. To se najbolje postiže kombinirajući politiku ekonomskog rasta sa politikama zapošljavanja socijalne sigurnosti i prava na rad u zajedničke napore zakonodavne izvršne vlasti, socijalnih partnera i civilnog društva. Stoga osobno smatram, stava sam da žena treba biti pravna snaga, a ne demokratski ukras. Kroz učenje, ulaganje u sebe, sticanje iskustava i znanja, kroz odgovornost i jasne stavove, žene se mogu izboriti za bolje pozicije kako na samom radnom mjestu, tako i u samom društvu. Naravno, to dobrim dijelom ovisi i o samim ženama. Hvala. From our aspect as female MPs and representatives of legislative power, our actions to increase social protection through improving the position of women in the labor market must be aimed at improvement through legislative solutions. This is best achieved by combining economic growth policies with employment, social security and labor rights policies with the joint efforts of legislators of legislators, the executive power, social partners and civil society. Therefore, I personally believe that a woman should be a real force, not a democratic ornament. Through learning, investing in themselves, gaining experience and knowledge, through reasonably and clear attitudes, uh, women can find the fight for better positions both in workplace and in society itself. Of course, this largely depends on the women themselves. Thank you for your attention. Voila. Thank you very much. Thank you also for your assistant and your translation. It was very, very helpful. Thank you very much. It's a very hard thing to do, really. Um, so uh, we have... Um, from the floor, we come to the floor, it's open. Again, please, one minute only. So we have Ms. Zaha al Bazar, President of the IPU Board of Young Members of Parliament. The floor is yours. Thank you for giving me the word. Um, it's important to have gender-sensitive social protection systems to support women, especially during COVID. I would like to highlight that it's also as important to include uh, well-being and mental health to this uh, protect protection systems, uh, especially because women were high, uh, highly impacted with this during taking care of the children. Um, and I would like to give an example that in Egypt, the government availed the hotline to uh, answer questions about COVID and to give psychological support for women and for the family as whole. Um, and that's actually one of our demands as Forum of Young Parliamentarians. We called for mental health services to be widespread for free for everyone. And I would really like to see such support widespread. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, now we have uh, President Fernandez from Bakla Sen. Bakla Sen. Here you are, yes, thank you. Muchísimas gracias. Eh... Thank you very much. It's very important to reflect upon what is happening in regions such as this, uh, Central America and the Domin Dominican Republic where we have many countries in development. Unfortunately, in our region, women are obliged. We don't have the option to be housewives, teachers, wives, psychologists, nurses, and all these types of jobs. And most of them are not paid for. And in these types of events where we come together, and women come together who have achieved uh, overcoming these types of challenges, we really need to find solutions and ways that will allow other women to achieve equity, equality, and all of their rights, particularly the rights of to social protection. So this is just a reflection, a comment that I would like to make. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. We have another speaker from the floor. It's uh, Abdala de Zamora from Argentina. Please. Sí, gracias. Simplemente eh, comentar que. En... Thank you very much. I just wanted to comment that in uh, Argentina, we are making a lot of progress in gender equality. We still have a lot to do, of course, but in the employment area, we have made uh, much progress. And something I would like to highlight is that we have a law that allows uh, women to, um, to finish work, to retire, and we get uh, women get extra years for the number of children that they have and also uh, even more years uh, earlier they can uh, retire for um, children with um, disab disabilities so this is one of the measures that the argentinian uh, government has introduced for uh, particularly for women who are in in situations of vulnerability, and this has affected uh, 4 million uh, women in, in Argentina. We have made progress in the Argentinian parliament, not just in uh, terms of equality, but also for uh, children. We are making it more easy for women to have an easier life and for uh, children, we're also promoting their participation in politics. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting examples. I think in general, it's very interesting for us all to get the examples from other countries and your reflections. Are there any comments here on the stage? No, it's everything said. If I may say, um Please. So, um, thank you for, for the last two comments especially. Uh, it is very common uh, for all our countries, I think, to see that uh, women, even those who were holding formal jobs in society, they were pushed out of these jobs and forced to go into uh, the informal labor sector, which is home carers, caregivers, to children, to the elderly, uh, to the sick. And unfortunately for these jobs, there's no pay, and there's, of course, no social policies to support these jobs. Uh, whereas we can provide support in different kinds of forms, like hotlines, uh, like psychological care, we cannot provide uh, time, we cannot provide financial remuneration for women to actually go back from the home into the economic sector, the today called real economic sector, which provides salaries, which then provides opportunities to, for women to support themselves and support their families. And I think this is a larger area and a larger discussion that all of us need to have here in this room, in other uh, debate platforms, and also back home in our respective societies and in our respective parliaments. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Another comment, please. Thank you very much. Si quería hacer eh, un par de reflexiones eh, en relación con las intervenciones que... I wanted to just uh, respond to some of the comments that we have received. The uh, president of the parliament in um, Argentina has promoted some um, specific measures, such as the uh, years of um, paying into the system per uh, child and recuperating years uh, for retirement per child. All of these measures are measures that are being introduced in Spain as well, and these are a first step of transition towards the goal which would be that we should pay into the system to the same extent as men. These are very important uh, comments and we also uh, received one of the comments about one of the key points post pandemic which will be mental health. Of course the mental health of all citizens is important, but particularly that of children and adolescents. And this really has to be focused on by all uh, parliaments and all governments. This is going to be the great challenge that we are going to see in the future. We must make sure that people are not left behind that um, have this uh, serious psychological uh, damage. And this is something that the governments and the public institutions have to work together towards. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Very, very interesting uh, debate also now. So there are, um, I think there is no question about um, the wish of all the countries to have a better social system. Um, the, there were many points raised, like, and examples raised from different countries, very interesting. Uh, one of the most important issues certainly is uh, to have to push people or to make it possible for women to go into the labor market and then uh, that they uh, get social security, but they need support. And we come back, so this cycle closes again, we come back, how do they, how are they able to go the, to, the, so, to the labor market? They need support at home, they need support for their uh, house duties, and we have heard examples from the northern countries. So um, we still have a lot to work on that issue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vala. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So the yes, microphones. I, may I hand over the floor to you now for the break. Thank you, Ms. Marcinon. Dear speakers, we've gained a lot of uh, good insights from this first session um, and on the crucial role of women and uh, girls, both during the pandemic and as we move towards recovery. Uh, thank you to speaker Christo and the delegation from Bosnia-Herzegovina for tackling the technical obstacles in such a good way. And thank you, Ms. Muttonen, for uh, your uh, good work as moderator, and we will meet after the lunch break as well. We will now be taking a lunch break uh, before moving on to the second session. We will meet back here at 1.30 p.m., and I just wish you bon appetit. Thank you. Swimming against the stream I watch the Eiffel Tower Disappear in the clouds That ride the wind that takes me home to you Put everything to use To use those traveler's blues Go on I'm a smart traveler. I know my way around. Born on the one grand side, I've learned to double time. I only like to wait under the sun. Don't you hate to wait when hard luck makes you late on time so blind? I'm a smart traveler. I know my way around. Born on the wandering side, I've learned to double time. I only like to wait another sun. I'm a smart Traveler, I know my way around. Born on the wandering side, I've learned to double time, swimming against the stream. <laughs> Thank you.
what you see in me. I don't know what I radiate. All I need is a piece of you To make it right just in time To watch the sun go down You're that sweet taste in my mouth My miss tingling May I hold your hand Night is ours if you come with me You give me a kiss And then suddenly Everywhere is music and we're dancing away Everybody knows You're shimmering a star that lights the sky To guide us through the dark and lead the way To supernova skies I know there's a truth in you Finding out what it means is like a dream come true In the shine of your smile You're shimmering my everything Lighting up the night Paint some super dust in the sky in your head there is a different tune All the groovy sounds that you have inside Just let them out And then you see Everywhere is music and 
your eyes dreams will come true winter Winter nights, it makes my world turn right again. Right outside, I'll guide you to my favorite treasure. Close your eyes, I'll kiss you goodbye. Winter nights.
How you feeling now you're dealing with the bare fact in fact it appears your act is just that hence check your almanacs note the date know your fate though you try to elevate i make the whole of the earthquake when i flow you hard your facade crumbles like jericho your mind's in the manacle and you an animal you see this millennium you'll be the cattle every day i got to battle like armageddon i'm bedding you hence will never see where i'm heading the time is now now is the time I dare you to open your mind. Open your mind. Sometimes I feel I've got you Run away, I've got you Get away from the pain you drive Into the hurt of me The love we share Seems to go nowhere And I've lost my life For a dust and turn I can sleep at night Once I run to you Now I run from you 
This tainted love you've given I give you all a boy could give you Take my tears and that's not nearly Oh, tainted love Tainted love you run away i've got you get away you don't really want any more from me to make things right you need someone to hold you tight and you think love is to pray but i'm sorry i don't pray that way once I ran to you, now I run from you. This tainted love you've given, I give you all a boy could give you. Take my tears and that's not nearly all. Tainted love, tainted love. Don't touch me, please, I cannot stand away. Tease, I love you, but you're hurt me so. Now I'm going to pack my things and go. Once I run to you, now I run from you. This tainted love you've given, I give you all a boy could give you. Take my tears, and that's not nearly all. Tainted love. É só certeza 
pra mim possa te deixar Não escapar E maintenant, c'est la valse Un, deux, trois Stop thinking about you Ooh. Hey, baby Now tell me you Is it a crime to love me? Oh, darling mm. Can't stop thinking about you You're my medicine yeah. Well, it's good Oh. 
the soul in me. Sensual, oh baby, my sexuality. No, darling, you set my spirit free. Let's hold on to each other. You're everything to me. Just grab a hold of me. Always on my mind. Oh, baby, you're my medicine. I need you. You are my destiny. Well, it's good for me. Oh, baby, and it's so good to me, my baby. You are my destiny. Hold on, hold on to me. You're my medicine. Let's make love tonight.
Você me abraça, me embaraça, deixa sem graça com a sua mania. Sinto o sol nascer, eu me derreter, me dissolver na sua presença. Se você me abraça, me embaraça, deixa sem graça com a sua mania. Sinto o sol nascer, eu me derreter, me dissolver na sua presença. Essa vida não dá pra ignorar o coração Essa vida não dá pra se viver sem a paixão Essa vida não dá pra se viver sem sedução Se você disser que tudo é apenas uma coisa tal de vai não Se você disser que a sua música é falada no violão Cai na luta e que não dá Que toda chance é só pra todo mundo Só não dá para você É que essa vida não dá pra ignorar o coração Essa vida não dá pra se viver sem a paixão Essa vida não dá pra se viver sem sedução Não dá pra 
segurar não dá não É todo dia um tal de se lutar, de levantar cedo para vencer É que essa vida não dá pra ignorar o coração Essa vida não dá pra se viver sem a paixão Essa vida não dá pra se viver sem sedução Se você me abraça, me embaraça, deixa sem graça com a sua manha. Se o sol nascer, eu me derreter, me dissolver na sua presença. É que essa vida não dá pra ignorar o coração. Essa vida não dá pra se viver sem a paixão. Essa vida não dá pra se viver sem sedução. Thank you.
here we are, alone at last. Come closer. I want to talk to you. Me and you are finally here together. We've been playing this game for so, so long. Now it's time to show you how I really feel. I've chosen this special night and this special place. This place, the Bella Food. Yeah. Turn your phone off. Just sit back and relax. I want you to free your mind tonight. Leave your troubles at the door. Sending this musical bouquet from me to you. So sit back and relax. Make it comfortable. You remember that night? The wine and candlelight. I want you to feel. And I want to be your everything.
yours and you
Thank you. 
Trevi Fountain to see the Pantheon. I need to put my hand on stone to ground my floating head. Forget that hotel bed. Stop waiting to get done. I learned to make my choices without a second thought. Call it instinct, call it fate. Don't you hate to wait when hard luck makes you late on time so blind? I'm a smart traveler. I know my way around. Born under one green sign, I learned to double time. I only like to wait under the sun. I'm a smart Traveler, I know my way around. Born on the wandering side, I've learned to double time, swimming against the stream. I watch the Eiffel Tower. Disappear in the clouds That ride the wind That takes me home to you Put everything to use To use those traveler's blues Go on and take me I'm a smart Traveler I know my way around Born on the one grand side I've learned to double time I only like to wait under the sun. <laughs> Don't you hate to wait? Hard luck makes you late on time so blind. I'm a smart traveler. I know my way around. Born on the wandering side, I've learned to double time. I only like to wait under the sun. I'm a smart traveler. I know my way around. Born on the wandering side, I've learned to double time. Swimming against the stream. What you see, I don't know what I ready. Sure, I won't be deterred, but I'm only, I'm only human. Is it my positivity, yeah, that keeps all these healthy friends' advice from me? My imperturbability, yeah. You ignore me as a no.
my way. I know I'm lucky, but this doesn't keep me from troubles or injury. Cause I'm tumbling, I'm stumbling, I'm falling so Hi Stephen, this is Becky, uh, just sound checking. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Hello, can you hear me? Hello, good afternoon. You're the sweet taste in my mouth. My miss tingling, may I hold your hand? Night is ours if you come with me. You give me a kiss, and then suddenly, everywhere is music, and we're dancing away. Thank you. 
How you feeling now you're dealing with the bare fact in fact it appears your act is just that hence check your almanacs note the date know your fate though you tried to elevate i make the whole of the earthquake when i flow you hard your facade crumbles like jericho your mind's in the manacle and you an animal you see this millennium you'll be the cattle every day i got to battle like armageddon i'm bending you heads will never see where i'm heading the time is now now is the time I dare you to open your mind. Open your mind.
Well, dear speakers, welcome back to our uh, meeting. I hope you've had a good lunch. So I would uh, ask now all of you to, um, to find your seats, and we will be ready to start in about one minute. So please find your seats, and we will start again. So, once again, welcome back from uh, the lunch, and I hope you had a good lunch. Before we dive into the after our afternoon session, I have the immense pleasure to welcome Mr. Abdullah Shahid, President-elect of the 60, 76th General Assembly of the United Nations. Mr. Shahid, welcome, and thank you for being with us today. We are pleased to have you with us, and you have the floor for five minutes. Please. 
the Honorable Torn Wilhelm Sentren, Speaker of Parliament and Chair of the Summit, Mr. Wolfgang Sobotak, President of the National Council of the Republic of Austria, Mr. Duarte Pacheco, President of the Interparliamentary Union. Thank you very much for this opportunity to participate in this important forum. I must commend you on your choice of the theme, Women at the Center, from confronting the pandemic to preserving achievements in gender responsive recovery. Ladies and gentlemen, I ask you, how many women worked as frontline workers, as doctors, nurses, EMTs, as food staff, as transport personnel, and in so many other areas during the darkest days of the pandemic? The answer is far too many to count, I'm sure. What I can be sure of is that during our time of need, when we were frightened and anxious, we turn to these women of courage for support and guidance. Nor was it only frontline workers, female heads of state and government, ministers of health and education, parliamentarians, women speakers, helped shepherd our way through some of the most challenging times and daunting issues. We owe all of these brave women a debt of gratitude. But more than this, we owe them recognition and respect. They stepped up when we needed them. Let us not turn around now and ask them to step back, step back down. Let us put the ladder in front of them and encourage them to continue the climb. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm reminded of the women who were asked to leave their homes during the Second World War and step in front of the men sent abroad. Women were asked to take the reins of production and manufacturing to essentially keep the economies float. And this opened the door to a generational change. While our situation today is vastly different, it echoes of the same spirit. Women have demonstrated what they have long known, but what society continues to deny them, that they must have a place at the head of the table. Ladies and gentlemen, it is fair to say that we have a long way to go if we are to achieve gender parity at the highest echelons of power. Women remain far too underrepresented in parliaments, in senior government roles, and at the highest levels at the United Nations. Only four out of the 76 presidents of the United Nations General Assembly have been women, and no secretary generals. This is abysmal. We can and must do better. Fulfilling the, promise, fulfilling the promise of the Beijing platform for action has been marred by dire statistics, such as the following. 21 female heads of state or government out of 193 countries. Only four countries have achieved gender parity in national legislature or parliaments, and a mere 15% of countries have reached 40% of women in local decision-making bodies. Dear parliamentarians, this is where you, as parliamentarians, can make a difference. You have the power to help amend the laws and policies which tend to serve as barriers to progress. You can accelerate gender equality and women's empowerment by tackling archaic laws and practices, patriarchy and sexual and gender-based violence. I'm proud to say that gender equality will be of paramount importance 
during my tenure as President of the United Nations General Assembly. I intend to, I intend to retain the gender advisory group created by my predecessor. I'm pleased to note that this also includes a parliamentary perspective, given that a member of the group is the permanent observer of the IPU to the United Nations. I have also ensured that my team in, in the office of the PGA is balanced with an equal amount of females and males, or even more females than males. And I have instructed my team, and I have taken this pledge that I will only attend and participate in, in panels where parity is assured. This is the bare minimum that one can expect from a male in power. Ladies and gentlemen, as men who have benefited from a patriarchal system, we have an obligation to take the steps necessary to empower women, even when it may be of inconvenience to ourselves or our own ambitions. The big picture must always be prioritized. My dear speakers and parliamentarians, I thank you once again for this opportunity to speak and I look forward to hearing what you have to say about it. I am here to assist you, work with you in reigning in a presidency of hope at the United Nations General Assembly where I intend to champion the cause of gender parity. I thank you. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Shahid, for your inspiring and important message. And now it's time to begin the second session of debates. And this second session entitled, Women in the Post-Pandemic Recovery, Preserving Achievements, Furthering Progress. It aims at identifying ways and means of preserving and consolidating women's achievements and furthering progress in a gender responsive recovery agency, a a agenda, agenda, sorry, <laughs> leaving no woman and no girl behind. To give us introductory re remarks, I invite Ms. Pramila Patton, the UN Special Representative of the Secretary General on Sexual Violence in Conflict and Acting Executive Director of UN Women. Ms. Patton, thank you for being with us. It's such a great pleasure to have you, and we look forward to your remarks. The floor is yours. Thank you. Secretary General of the Interparliamentary Union, President-elect of the UN General Assembly, distinguished women speakers from around the world, parliamentarians, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I thank the Interparliamentary Union for inviting me to this summit to discuss the critical role that national parliaments can play in preserving the hard-won gains achieved on the Women, Peace, and Security agenda in the post-pandemic recovery, and to discuss how the IPU and my office are coming together to respond and support these efforts through the signature and implementation of a framework of cooperation to address conflict-related sexual violence. Conflict-related sexual violence does not occur in a vacuum. It is linked with wider security factors, such as the resurgence of hostilities, the rise of violent extremism, arms proliferation, and the collapse of the rule of law, many of which have been exacerbated by the pandemic and its ensuing consequences. COVID-19 has revealed that the risk of falling victim of sexual and gender-based violence have not diminished, but the possibility to seek assistance and redress has. My office continues to monitor with concern the trends and patterns of conflict-related sexual violence, 
through the annual report of the Secretary General and the compounding effects of the pandemic. For instance, despite the Secretary General's call for a global ceasefire after the COVID-19 outbreak, many parties to armed conflict continue to use sexual violence as a cruel tactic of war, terror, torture, and political repression to advance their strategic objectives, including to propel population flight and control contested territory and natural resources. We have also observed that women and girls in overcrowded refugee and displacement settings are among those hardest hit by the intersecting crisis of conflict, forced displacement, and the pandemic. And they are exposed to heightened risk of sexual violence, exploitation, and trafficking. This situation has been exacerbated by an overall decline in humanitarian reach due to the imposition of measures aimed at curbing the spread of COVID-19 and a climate of constrained financial resources for the provision of life-saving services for survivors. Economic desperation and collapsed community protection mechanisms have also increased the use of negative coping mechanisms, such as child marriage and survival sex. COVID-19 has also given rise to new gender-specific protection concerns linked with militarization, checkpoints, and border closures. For instance, cases of sexual harassment of women, healthcare workers, and sexual violence against women detained for alleged curfew violations have been documented. The imposition of quarantines, curfews, lockdowns, and other restrictions on, on movement has hampered the possibility for survivors to access justice and comprehensive services, further height, height, heightening the existing structural, institutional, and sociocultural barriers to seeking redress for such crimes. Already a dramatically underreported crime, conflict-related sexual violence has been further obscured by the pandemic. Despite these challenges, we must ensure that gains made in terms of political commitments, prevention and response are not rolled back or reversed. In a post-pandemic era, we must redouble our efforts to tackle the root causes of discrimination and widespread inequalities, which are an invisible driver of violence against women, including conflict-related sexual violence. And women parliamentarians must play a central role in that response. In discharging my mandate, I am guided by the firm belief and conviction that the earlier and the deeper the seeds to prevent conflict-related sexual violence are sowed, the better and more sustainable their fruits will be. My office is currently de developing a comprehensive prevention of conflict-related sexual violence framework to serve as a roadmap to foster prevention efforts at the global, regional, and national levels. It is my hope that this framework will guide world leaders, such as yourselves, in translating the concept of preventing conflict-related sexual violence into a practical reality. As women parliamentarians, you have the influence and the power to drive change. You represent different constituencies, constitution and legal system, geographies and cultures in which sexual and gender-based violence, including conflict-related sexual violence, has manifested. Allow me to suggest three concrete recommendations that will and could enhance the protection of women and girls during the pandemic recovery. First and foremost, as parliamentarians, you can enact comprehensive legislation that criminalizes all forms of sexual and gender-based violence in line with international standards and due process of law. Currently, in many countries covered by my mandate, the legislative framework remains inadequate. And this includes, for instance, lack of comprehensive definition of sexual violence, absence of victim and witness protection laws, 
and provisions for reparations to survivors or legal frameworks to protect children born of wartime rape. Secondly, you can ensure that these laws are survivor-centered and recognize survivors as rights holders that require dignity and respect, physical and legal protection, holistic medical and psychosocial support, reintegration and rehabilitation services by the state, as well as restitution by perpetrators. In addition, they must provide for accessible and quality services for families of survivors, including children born of rape and the survivors' communities. Witnesses, human rights defenders, judicial officials, and parliamentarians must also be protected by law. Lastly, it is also critical to ratify and implement international human rights instruments, such as the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, which guarantees women and girls to be free from all forms of violence and discrimination in conflict or in peacetime, and therefore the rights of women and girls to justice and services on the same basis as men and boys. With these roles in mind, in June of this year, my office and the Interparliamentary Union signed a framework of cooperation to assist you as parliamentarians in your efforts to combat the scourge of sexual violence. We are also coordinating the rollout of a model legislative guidance and provision on the investigation and prosecution of conflict-related sexual violence developed by my office to assist legislators in enacting and implementing laws, deterring sexual violence from occurring, and providing justice and redress, even while this pandemic is ongoing. In partnership with IPU, I look forward to working very closely with all of you in the implementation of this critical framework, which includes areas such as raising awareness amongst parliamentarians to address conflict-related sexual violence and its root causes, advocating for the implementation of national laws to promote and protect the rights of all individuals affected by or at risk of this crime, providing technical assistance to member parliaments on the drafting of such laws and empowering survivors and those impacted by conflict-related sexual violence in their country's legislative processes. There have been many commitments made about addressing conflict-related sexual violence, but we must translate these commitments into concrete actions and results by tackling the root causes of gender inequality and converting cultures of impunity for these crimes into cultures of deterrence and prevention. My mandate stands ready to cooperate with the IPU in heeding and, and, and hearing the voices of survivors in the design of a gender responsive pandemic recovery and breaking the silence in our parliaments to resolutely combat conflict-related sexual violence. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Patton, for those uh, introductory remarks and strong words. And then I would like again to call uh, on uh, Ms. Christine Muttonen. Um, our wonderful moderator to moderate the second round of debates and then we may actually uh, go down and Ms. Mattenen, please. The floor is yours for the remainder of this session. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. Hello. Something was bad with mm -hmm. my... I'm from the other side. Yeah. 
Hello, nice to meet you. Hello. Distinguished, distinguished uh, speakers, you can take away your mask here. Uh, distinguished presidents, um, I'm looking forward to hearing your expertise also this afternoon here on the panel, but also from the floor. And uh, before we start, I just want to give you a message. We are very active, as you can see on this board, we are very active on social media today. You can see it here. We invite you to join the conversation by using hashtag 13SVSP and tagging the IPU and the Austrian Parliament in your Twitter, Instagram and LinkedIn posts. So please take part in the discussion in the social media. Um, parliament, parliaments are a kind of reflection of society or better should be a reflection of society. Parliamentarians are certainly role models, but obviously it's mainly 75% men. Globally, and it was said, we have 25% parliamentarians who are women. And each year, we only gain 0 0.5 percent more women. So each year 0.5 percent more women in parliaments. Um, mathematicians among you will know that this will take a while. So we come to our first mission, uh, first motion of the second session and it is uh, political will can make parity in parliament a reality globally by 2030. 30, so quite soon. To discuss this topic, I'm pleased to have with us three women speakers of parliament, Ms. Esperanza Laurinda Francisco Nuyane Bias, speaker of the Assembly of the Republic of uh, Mozambique. Welcome, thank you for being with us. Ms. Beatrice Argimon, President of the General Assembly of the Senate of Uruguay. And welcome. And you both will speak in favor of the uh, motion. And we have Ms. Eliane Tillieu, President of the House of Representatives of uh, Belgium, who will have slightly different views. We will listen to it. So. <laughs> Welcome and thank you. So, um, Madame Bias, uh, can we start with your yes, uh, with your speech? And please remember, it's the three minutes. I will try. <laughs> thank you. Uh, dear Christine, honourable speakers, ladies and gentlemen. It's our understanding that to, to achieve the gender equality and parity, it's necessary first and foremost to ensure that women and girls have rights to access to education, education and health care, and provide platforms for access to power, to secure employment, uh, pro property ownership, attainment of success and vigorously combating the violence against the women. It is important to combat all the menace of violence against women and girls. Only by doing so, we can, uh, would like to encourage all the speakers who are present here so that each one of us be an activist for the chain of the political, economic, and social paradigms in our countries so that we may be able to achieve the aspired parity. In Mozambique, 
uh, in Mozambique, my country, is ranked uh, a privileged position in the world global legislature with 106 women in, in parliament, which means 42.4 of the 250 members of parliament are women who are distributed among the three group parties which have seats in, in, in the Mozambican parliament. Three out of the nine committees, uh, 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 nine of three out of the nine committees are chaired by the uh, by women, and two of three of the uh, caucus two are chaired by women. We, this shows that uh, uh, the this. This reality leads us to the conclusion that uh, the internal electoral system of political parties are crucial to, through internal democracy, influencing the p placement of women in position that uh, can ensure parity in composition. Women in representation in Mozambique shows an encouraging figure and trend and genuine will to promote gender parity, but indicating that uh, we are on the right track to achieve the parity by 2030. So we need to also do this by our way of being. I would like to conclude by saying that we are reaffirm our support for this motion because we are sure that, yes, we can achieve the gender parity in the parliament in the parliaments by 2030. And I thank you very much for your kind attention. You, uh, Ms. Argimon from Uruguay, please. Muy buenas tardes. Good afternoon, dear President of the Parliaments of the World. First of all, I would like to thank the President of the Parliament of Norway and the President of this forum for the possibility of being here together and reflect on all the issues that we have been debating and that we're going to debate. So, Madam President, thank you very much for this opportunity to be able to meet face to face all together. This motion, without any doubt, puts us into our position of uh, women uh, politicians and this debate is centered on an issue of democracy, on an issue of equality in our democracies. We understand that talking of democracy, of better quality, implies advancing so that, so that women, women's focus is where, on a leg legislative um, level, are improved. So many of you, the quota law was, for many of you, the quota law was a tool that allowed us, without any doubt, to reach this number of parliamentarians that today at this event, we can say has advanced and is advancing, continues to advance, but without any doubt, it has been very slow. And therefore, in the 21st century, there is no other option but to um, resort to another uh, tool. That's why it's very important that at this meeting we don't just think of the next few years but we need to think of the quality of democracy in our countries that we need to advance to uh, equal democracies. We can't allow us that ourselves the luxury to, of not having half of our populations in the legislation of our countries for several reasons. First of all, because it's a matter of human rights without any doubt. And secondly, because it is to do with the quality of our democracy, as we mentioned earlier. And thirdly, because the world cannot, cannot go without the contribution of women. That's why I am inviting you to fight for our equal uh, democracies because with no, without any doubt the construction together of men and women fighting together will lead to a better world. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Uh, Madam, till you, may I ask you for the floor? Madame la Présidente, chers collègues, c'est évidemment un immense plaisir pour moi. Madame la Présidente, c'est un grand plaisir pour moi pour ce 13th uh, summit. It's uh, dealing with an issue that is so important, as important as uh, it, parity. It is also political, a strong political will. It's a vital that we, we concentrate on the facts on a daily basis. Of course, we've adopted measures to reinforce political participation of women, and therefore the policies in several countries is not the same as it is for men. That's why women are underrepresented in parliament. And we think that we have to create an environment which is amenable to women's participation. So we have to encourage their full and effective participant. How? we have to raise awareness of public, public awareness and the necessity for diversity, the equality of sexes, and make um, awareness raising campaigns in schools, in the media, on social media. We have to eliminate stereotypes, sexist stereotypes. We have to uh, take many other steps, education policies, to have an e a perspective of equality of sexes, we have to have a lead a struggle against violence against women, which is still a big uh, obstacle. We see that on social media. It's to make women financially independent. And we must also carry out certain uh, internal uh, internal measures adapted to um, specific situations of women in the assembly parliaments must contribute to these changes we are we are key actors with all our colleagues men and women we must therefore uh, create an action plan uh, where women are elected they must take on their fact um, their functions without any obstacles there are many commissions for example this role continues in a completely stereotyped way. In Belgium, in the session 2020 to 2021, we had a, a commission for um, creating equality. We have to have, once we had, a, we must have a minister of defense who is a woman, a minister for foreign affairs for the first time. It has to be completely 50-50. The half of the parliaments in Belgium are presided by women. And for the first time, um, there were two women in the presidency of the chamber and in the Senate. And I'm the first woman, woman in the chamber of, um, of the Senate. Of course, uh, it's possible to make progress. That's why we have decided, we've risen to the challenge together so that women know how to collaborate. And we have started the challenge so that our parliament can become one of the most sensor, um, most aware parliaments from 2030 with the support that I would like to see here. I'd like to thank you once again for uh, advancing on five issues that we explained on five issues, influencing proce processes so that uh, women's uh, concerns have an important place in the debates and finally to have uh, to have a gender sensitive legislation and and we have a very big job that we hope to be able to carry out in the future together woman to woman president of parliaments and assemblies thank you very much Uh, topic and we had very good examples so um, I'm sure that there are a lot of comments so we can take up five contributions for the floor and I would like 
is to know um, where are we on the way to parity in your countries, in your parliaments. So if there are Japan, please, from and Germany. Mm -hmm. Thank you for giving me the floor. So regarding this uh, proposition number two. Um, it, ah, so we, we move on uh, to Germany, please. Uh, Frau Roth, bitte. Yes, you were asking what the state of play is, and I have to say I'm quite jealous of Belgium in the German Bundestag, we only have a 30% proportion of women. We've actually gone back. Uh, we've, it's a setback. Before 1989, the, it's true that um, what we've experienced is a, is a rise in sexism in the house. Uh, so that's why I think it's really important that we as women not just insist That they have a that women have a, demo, a voice in democracy and that it's fair, but also that this is a matter of improving the quality of political decision making. In my party, we have a quota. Fifty-eight percent of our parliamentarians are women, and what I've seen is that the perspective on politics changes when women describe financial policies that are based on gender budgeting, when men also work in, f in committees devoted to youth and family, for example. That changes things. That means that we have an equal voice, because w and that is necessary because we also improve the quality of legislation by giving our voice. And I hope We've got elections coming up in three weeks, and I hope that this changes for the better because it's been a really tough four years with 70% male dominance and only 30% women. Um, we come to our next speaker, Madam President from Bulgaria, please. The floor is yours. Dear colleagues, allow me to address you in the name of the Assembly of Bulgar Bulgaria and also for the name of the women in the Bulgarian Parliament. The pandemic has highlighted problems that have been a challenge for all but particularly for women politicians and particularly politicians who have had to make the right decision. Union is extremely important and necessary. Today there are two major topics, the future of humanity with a cleaner more democratic world and a world that is um, friendly towards people. For women, the family and society are two specific uh, intervening topics. I want to give you some facts about Bulgaria. 
in the National Assembly of the Republic of Bulgaria, out of 240 ministers, there are just 58 women. And we have 59, there are 59 of these who are women. Out of a full assembly of uh, 300. There are very few uh, women parliamentarian, but these are strong, uh, they are very active personalities and active figures. People really know their names and they remember their acts. Women should really uh, grasp the power that they have. And we should respect uh, women's rights. These women should make the right choices for women and support and uh, keep on fighting for women. And this will mean that we can make progress and change society in Bulgaria and in the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, are there any other comments from the floor? Yes, Pala Sen, please. Yes, the floor is yours. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much. In terms of parity, the Central American region and the Republican, uh, Dominican Republic is progressing step by step. In the national parliaments, we have legislated for women. This is uh, an achievement. We have introduced uh, quotas as well for the elections of uh, of ministers. This, this is such in Honduras, Panama, El Salvador, the uh, Dominican Republic. And they have between 30 and 50 percent of women in the parliaments. In other countries, we have progressed a little more as well, not only in parity, but also, also um, alternating between uh, women and men. So we still have a lot of work, but we have made some progress. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, the, um, uh, the list is closed. We have um, still now the speaker from Bahrain. Thank you, Madam Chair. I wanted to talk about this very important topic, this very urgent topic, but I will start where my colleagues have stopped, and I want to say that we are speakers of Parliament who are here present in this hall. We uh, uphold a very uh, important responsibility to participate positively and to change the stereotypes that all women suffer from all over the world. We are responsible for that. We are responsible for that in order to pave the way for other women coming after us. In the Kingdom of Bahrain, thank God, we have been able to be in the political arena and we have around 19% women parliamentarians in a parliament without the need of a quota and without what we call positive discrimination. Here I am, a woman in front of you who have been in office three times. And uh, this third time, I am a parliamentarian, but not only that, I have been elected as speaker of parliament. And this is the first time something like that happens. And that is why we are able to see the future will be better. And the Bahraini uh, society, let me tell you, has been able to put aside uh, gender issues and gender discrimination where the woman has been given her due worth. The woman has been able to play a very important part in the legislative process. That is why I call upon all my sisters, all women in parliament to really 
be the pioneers of change in order to get rid of the stereotypical images that we have all over the world because the percentages of women in parliament so far are not enough. Those percentages are definitely not enough. It is a start though and it is upon us. We are responsible to make sure that one day in the near future that percentage becomes 50% to reach true parity. Thank you. Unfortunately, we have to close the list from the floor, but I would like to ask you if you have any comments. Any, any comments on what was said? Uh, yes. uh, I would like to reaffirm that this is a fight that all of us women, we should continue doing we the women that we are now parliamentarians we should uh, uh, stimulate that more girls should uh, get interested in politics this uh, uh, we have to give more access to education to girls and uh, and women and, and girls in health and education this is the way to pave the way for the women participation in politics uh, uh, yes yes okay. I would like to just say that in this change, uh, we have to stress our rights. It has been a struggle that's been taking place for a long time. And I would like to re-stress that I hope that in the 21st century, after all of these struggles, that once and for all, we will obtain this equity uh, that we hear about so much because I think that it has taken too long and that we should be there with our contribution within our countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for this uh, panel. I think uh, when One we... Minute. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yes, of course. <laughs> yeah. I would like also to say how important it is to be exemplary in our positions. We are carrying out this function, it is still rare, and we should really use it to give hope to women, and particularly to young women and to girls, to give them this um, need, this will to start a political career. And we need to take away these breaks, this slow work, for example, the um, policies that aren't uh, gender um, responsive and uh, using quotas. I don't, we don't want to have less, uh, a, a lower percentage of women, as I've heard in some contrib contributions today. So we need to make sure we keep these numbers of women in Parliament, around 40% that we have at the moment. And we need to use legislation, such as, for example, lots of women who are really working on equality, on uh, healthcare and education, but they're not found in the commissions or the works on defence, um, the uh, interior work, etc. And this isn't something that is set out, it's just stereotypical behaviour. And so to correct this, we have to uh, really work on this and try and change things. We need to give the opportunity to all, to everyone to do exactly what they want to do. And that is the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. So it, it, is, it is clear that you are key actors and role models for the next generation as well. And I think what was also important is that um, with women on board or women at the table, the, pers the perspective of policy changes. And that's why it's so important to have more women. Thank you very much. We now need, yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We now need five minutes uh, to change the microphones because we are going to have now six persons here on the thank panel. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to be well, here with you.
So we have half of them. Yeah. And the other half is the Okay. Hi. Hello, nice, nice to meet you. you. You're from uh, Honduras. Honduras. Yes. I know you. <laughs> Hello. Hello. You are from Cyprus. Ah, oh, Cyprus, yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we'll see. I hope the others work as well. While uh, while we are still um, writing the history of the pandemic, unfortunately, as we see, everybody's covering and we have to make tests. Unfortunately, it's not over at all. We have also to talk about the future. 
we realized in this, during this pandemic how fragile we are as a planet, how fragile our global economy is, and the difficult task will be to improve environmental and social norms. Gender equality certainly will or might help us to do so. So we move on to the next motion uh, on economic, economic recovery. The motion is laws, policies and resource allocations that aim to empower women economically will help to achieve a global economic recovery post-pandemic. As you can see, and we are very pleased, we have six women speakers here with us. And uh, I want to welcome Ms. Akiko Santo, the President of the House of Councils of Japan. Welcome. Just a minute. Ms. Galina Karelova, the Duty, Deputy Speaker of the Council of the Russian Federation. It's a pleasure. Oops. Ms. Shabina Gafarova, the Chairwoman of the National Assembly of Azerbaijan, welcome. <laughs> Ms. Fanny Carolina Salinas Fernandez, the President of the Central American Parliament, welcome. <laughs> they will speak for the motion. And we have Ms. Anita Demetrio, the President of the House of Representatives of Cyprus, welcome. <laughs> And Ms. Claudia Roth, the Vice President of the German Bundestag. Thank you very much for being with us. They both will share slightly different views. So I would like to start with Ms. Santo from Japan. Her microphone is far away, I cannot hear her. Her microphone is too far away. Thank you for granting me the floor. My name is Akiko Santo, President of the House of Councillors. I'm delighted and honored to attend and address this in-person segment of the Summit of Women Speakers of Parliament, which the IPU convenes for the first time since we were affected by the pandemic. First, let me say a few words regarding the Tokyo Olympic and Paralympic Games. Due to the pandemic, many competitions were held without spectators at the venues. Nevertheless, the athletes who came to Japan after overcoming various obstacles put forth every effort into the exciting games and those of us who watched them were and are deeply moved. On behalf of Japan, I'd like to thank all countries and nations who kindly sent their teams of athletes. Thank you very much, I say in English. Now, women are affected most by the consequences of the economic crisis triggered by the pandemic. The industrial sectors dealing with tourism, hotels and accommodations, food and beverage, etc., were financially negatively affected and those are the sectors where many women are employed. As for irregular workers, the ratio of women is higher than that of men, and women are more likely to lose their jobs and receive less income. Now, let me give you an example of Japan. In April 2020, when the first state of emergency was declared, the reduction in the number of employed persons as compared to the previous month was for men 390,000 and for women, 700,000. There was a noteworthy decline in the number of women employed in the sectors of food and beverage, as well as hotel and accommodations. To counter this, 
an important policy 2021 was enacted in June this year, which focuses on the active participation of women and joint participation of women and men. The policy's emphasis lies in promoting women's reacquisition of digital skills, education and training. It will enhance occupational training for single parents and it will enhance consultation and assistance to women who are facing difficulties or are feeling insecure. Important to note is the fact that in Japan, unfortunately, gender equality and joint participation of women and men had not progressed in normal times. I regard this crisis as an opportunity to deal with structural problems which ha have not been visible. I am convinced that reviewing the conventional way women and men are regarded, reviewing the fixed gender-based roles, and working on and drafting legislation to empower women are key for Japan to achieve growth after the pandemic. Over the past two years, I have been attending many discussions as president of the House of Councillors and saw that in these difficult times, many women parliamentarians have actively raised issues and deliberated policies from various perspectives. This made me realize once again, the importance of incorporating the competencies of women in vital posts that deal with policy decisions. I hope that this forum will grant me another opportunity to absorb various views from my esteemed colleagues. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we come now to our next speaker, uh, Ms. Kar Karelova from Russia. Please have the floor. Is distinguished colleagues, let me welcome all the participants to this uh, summit uh, on behalf uh, of uh, Valentina uh, Matvienko, the Speaker of the Council of uh, Federation. Indeed, the pandemic affected not only health of our people, but our economies. Regarding women, we can see two different tendencies. On the one hand, we can see, and we heard about it today, that women are more vulnerable. A lot of them uh, were affected by a decrease in pa payroll, in uh, firing. And on the other hand, women were very flexible and uh, succeeded in adapting to this situation, they continue to work together with in international organizations. Women in crisis are able and were able to find creative solutions. Then, 16% of Russian entrepreneurs started to develop uh, different type of businesses. 93% of them are willing to develop further their new businesses. That confirms the right decision to more equally distribute our resources in order to enable and empower people and women especially to stabilize our economy. In Russia, before the pandemic, women were assisted by different economic measures that was adopted by legislation. Small and medium enterprises were assisted in this regard. Up uh, to 40% of these uh, businesses received uh, a special, special help. Dear colleagues, I'm convinced that this summit will give a new impetus to our legislation, 
activity. Thus, our discussions, I believe, should continue. In particular, we are planning to discuss these topics on the third Pan-Russian Summit on Women that will take place in October 2021. Let me in invite all of you to take part in this forum. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your remarks. Um, now we come to Mrs. Gafora, Gafarova from Azerbaijan. Please, you have the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to attend this summit and uh, to give speech. Our focus on the women in the pandemic and the post-pandemic is recognition of their significant contribution to a better and a safer world. Today, women being the main part of our societies continue to play an important role in responding to challenges imposed by the global health crisis. I do believe that today it is important to empower women to save our achievements and to develop them in post-pandemic period. Dear participants, I would like to brief you on the achievements my country has in women empowerment. Azerbaijan has a proud history in providing a good environment for women to play an important role in the society. Azerbaijan was the first country in the Muslim world granting women the right to vote and to be elected. It happened in 1918, even earlier than in many European countries. After restoring its independence in 1991, Azerbaijan has made considerable progress in empowering women, including the establishment of the State Committee on Women Issues, orders on the increase of role of women, and state policy on women, as well as adoption of various laws dealing with the eradication of gender inequality and violence against women. And today, women in Azerbaijan take high decision-making positions as well. It should be mentioned that specific budgetary allocations have been made to ensure an increase in the gender mainstreaming process in Azerbaijan. Some international projects on this issue are being implemented in Azerbaijan now. Dear participants, I believe that in time of pandemic, special attention should be paid worldwide to the needs and concerns of the women and girls who are refugees and internally displaced persons, in particular by advocating and promoting their rights to return to their places of origin in dignity and safety. Unfortunately, nowadays, there are many countries having these vulnerable groups, and one of these countries is Azerbaijan. We have more than 1 million refugees and IDPs who left their homes followed by the Armenian aggression at the end of the 20th century. And the big part of them are women and girls. After the 44-day patriotic war last year, Azerbaijan, by its military political means, put an end to nearly a 30-year-long occupation of 20% of our territories by Armenia, liberated its historical land Karabakh and restored its territorial integrity. It was followed by the signing of the trilateral statement on 10 November 2020, aimed at ensuring sustainable peace in the region. Unfortunately, the process is currently hindered by the mined areas of the liberated lands left by Armenian occupants and continuous provocations on our borders by Armenia. Dear participants, I strongly believe that we parliamentarians will do our best efforts on the way to help conflict affected women in having a meaningful and productive life in new circumstances in post-pandemic. And I hope that the results of our summit will contribute to the well-being of women and girls. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this point. Um, next, uh, Madame uh, Fernandez, please, you have the floor. You could also stay seated if you like. Yes. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. It's an honor to be able to speak to you as the president of the Central American Parliament, a political organ of the system of 
integration in Central America and the Dominican Republic. The pandemic uh, provoked by COVID-19 surprised the entire world, the whole world. And it had unbelievable consequences as nobody was prepared to face such a disease, an invisible enemy, an invisible but deadly enemy that provoked um, confinement, isolation, that made women carry out many roles of which today we are still continuing to do. Uh, as women during the pandemic, we had to carry out more tasks. We are mothers, we are teachers, full-time teachers, housewives, wives, psychologists, nurses, workers, etc. And also during the pandemic, that was when more attacks against women were registered, more abuse and fam family violence. The situation of uh, quarantine or confinement uh, brought about serious threats to the women's, many women's and children's or girls' safety. As the time that women were spending at, uh, at home increased, and so they had more jobs and more tasks to complete, and uh, they had less time to be able to seek help. So uh, some regions, at least one in four women experienced physical or sexual violence caused by their partner in most of the Latin American countries. The pandemic highlighted disequality between men and women, but also it also highlighted the importance of uh, care or care for sustainability of life. So it's important to be able to reflect in this space and be able to point out the, vis the small vis visibility. Um, we need to point out the importance of women to take part in the economy of the, our region. We have to think about the responses to the needs of the population from a, a point of view of gender is very important and we have to work towards incorporating the perspective of gender in macroeconomic policies of social protection and employment amongst others. Um, according to Sepal, the seven years of slow economic growth that have been accumulating in Latin America and the Caribbean have have increased poverty and uh, inequality can also affect women significantly. Just if the effects of COVID-19 led to the um, loss of income of 5% of the population, poverty could increase by 3.5%. This implies 107 million women in the region that would be in uh, that would fall into poverty. It's very important that we are able to reflect on this data. Various institutions today are providing for us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, impressive figures. Yes, we heard. Um, now the next one uh, is Ms. Demetrio. Please, you have the floor. Dear colleagues, Your Excellencies, first of all, I'm honored to address the summit as the first ever elected president, women president for my country. And you will allow me, before all, before anything else, to express my grave concern over the unspeakable humanitarian crisis that is unfolding across Afghanistan. Violence and chaos have forced thousands of people to flee their country, of whom 80% of women and girls fearing for their basic human rights, their safety, and freedom of movement. Afghan women and girls are at risk of being deprived of their participation in public life, their access to education, employment, health, and justice. Rights and freedoms, they have become an integral part of life for women and girls in Afghanistan during the last 20 years may vanish if the international community fails to act swiftly and collectively to safeguard their fundamental human rights. As legislators, we must do our most to ensure the security of Afghan women and girls, provide humanitarian aid and support, and make sure their voices can be heard. We must act now and exercise our influence 
where necessary. We cannot remain complacent and passive in the face of yet another emergency. Dear fellow women speakers, the impact of crisis are never gender, new, gender neutral. The COVID-19 pandemic has caused a huge health, economic and social crisis, which calls for a gender responsive recovery. Recovery efforts must focus on women's economic empowerment, which in turn will help bridge gender gaps in all spheres of public life, economic, social and political. Parliaments across the world must aim at generating the necessary political will towards achieving women's financial empowerment. We must step up our efforts to lift persisting obstacles for the full implementation of relevant policies and measures, both in time of crisis and in a post-COVID-19 world. We must make women's economic empowerment a key component of national recovery plans. Through our core factions, which pertain to enacting legislation, exercising parliamentary oversight, approving the state budget and representing our citizens, we do have the means to enable a sustainable post-pandemic recovery. So we need to adopt and implement specific policies. That is the first one. And second of all, we need to restructure a social system. The Archorics, no country can prosper without the engagement and the empowerment of women, which all women and girls in their diversity and talents must be adequately represented across the educational, social, economical and political environments. Bold and unwearing action is necessary across the world to bring women into the heart of decision making in large numbers and as full partners. There is no doubt that this can and must be done now if we are to achieve a resilience and sustainable post-pandemic recovery. So let's merge together in action. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now the last speaker is you, please, Madame Roth. Thank you very much, dear colleagues, dear friends. I think after the painful COVID social distancing, this meeting, this conference, this gathering is really very, very important. Important for deepening our understanding of each other and the challenges women and marginalized communities are facing worldwide. Important also to reinforce empathy across borders and urgently needed to strengthen our feminist ties in order to step up our, our joint actions for democracy and for human rights. What unites us is the fundamental notion that women's rights are human rights because women are human beings. And that is a question of justice, that marginalization and unjust distribution of power and resources must be overcome in this world in which patriarchy is still so painfully alive. Saying this, you might rightly ask why I'm opposing this motion on laws that aim to empower women economically. I have to oppose it because I am convinced that aiming for minor chances only, changes only, for some small adjustments while maintaining an inherent unjust economic system, the male-dominated, the post-colonial, the ecologically destructive, the unjust pre-COVID system would not be doing us a favor, would only be for the benefit of some already privileged women while reinforcing the injustices faced by millions of women and girls. Of course, women and girls should be economically empowered, but not in order to instrumentalize them, but not for the sake of someone else's benefit, not while ignoring the root causes of injustices. It is a question of human rights and global justice that our societies and economies allow all, all to thrive in dignity. So when we think bold, we have to be in favor not of economic recovery, but of economic transformation, a feminist, a decolonial, 
a socio-ecological transformation of our global system that includes the redistribution of unpaid care work, that includes just allocation of resources between the North and the South, between all genders and all people, that of course includes combating the climate crisis. So let's be bold in our demands. Let's not aim for minor chances. Let's aim for feminist transformations. And let us not forget the women in Afghanistan, the girls in Afghanistan, and I won't forget the brave and courageous women of Belarus, like Maria Kalesnikova, this morning she was sentenced to 11 years of prison. Why? Because she was fighting for democratic rights and freedom. Thank you very much. Very interesting uh, inputs from your side. Um, now we have uh, the possibility to have two or three comments from the floor. So, um, are there any comments from the floor? Everybody agrees, and everybody is very impressed by your by your speeches. Um, I think that uh, what was important was uh, to hear that uh, we have to to think big, we have to change systems because if we give women just a little bit of power, so, or just for example, if we have a parliament, a female parliamentarians in parliament, then there is the question, do they really have power? So we have to empower women in any case, but we also have to think big. And what was mentioned was uh, that it is important to support women with education and with training. Uh, it was also mentioned that there are uh, special needs um, are, is needed for single mothers. So um, these are areas where we should focus on. The main obstacle, obstacles for women to participate in the, um, in, in the labor market certainly is again, and we, we kind of go in circles, is the family care and the duties they have to do. So we have to support on that in all the sessions. This was one <coughs> of the main issues. How do we manage to get fathers to do the family work and support women if they have children, so that they can be part of the labor market, but also have their families. So the work must have must be divided. Um, any comments so far? Are there any remarks from your side to the other speakers? No. I think uh, I think it's kind of a we have to change the cultural norms. And this can be done by education. Mm -hmm. And this can be done today in another session. Media was mentioned. We need media for that. And we need the parliamentarians, the female parliamentarians, to act as role models. Mm -hmm. You want to? Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. You can. Thank you. I'd like to actually take this opportunity to ask questions to the floor. In Japan, we have women who run business and they also create a business for babysitters, providers, and food industries. And we see a lot of uh, growth of businesses run by women. But those uh, business women have issues when they are to try to embark on this uh, journey, uh, financial aid is very difficult to gain through the financier. That's a, neck, a bottleneck of uh, entrepreneurship among women. So I think education in this area needs to be given uh, in a way that the women will be trusted in the first place in the banking industry so that 
they're going to lend money to those women. I think we need to create a system like that. Thank you. Women into the, into the bank system and economy. Uh, um, Madam Roth, you wanted to have the floor. I think it is important what the, what the colleague from Japan said, that we should understand that the crisis is a chance. Uh, a chance, but not for small uh, developments, but for a structural and uh, systematic reform, because we are, not only of, we are not only faced by the pandemic, but we are faced worldwide by a fully pandemic. And if you look who are so the victims, but also those who can do something against it, it's always women. We have a tremendous increase of hunger in the world. We have poverty after the pandemic. We have inequality. We have violence, especially women and girls. We have the problem of authoritarianism, uh, more repression, and we have the problem of education, especially a uh, terrible uh, perspective for girls' child. And I see now the president of Bangladesh, of the parliament of Bangladesh, we have the climate crisis, and we see who are souls who are suffering most, also women and, and children. So we need a, really a completely transformation, a social ecological transformation. And the second point I wanted to mention is, I was so happy that uh, the Swedish former foreign minister, Margot Wallström, she defined and redefined foreign policy as a feminist foreign policy. So what does feminism today mean? It's not only good for women, it's also good for everybody, because it it's, it insists on self-determination without repression and, and in freedom. And I think this should be the starting point for us and not to be too modest. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you wanted to have the floor. Yes. Bueno, muchas gracias. Just, no, uh, sorry. Ah, disculpe. <laughs> Just very quick. Yeah, that equality is a matter of democracy. So we need to, what we are saying today, we need to, it needs to be addressed to everybody, all the men in the world, the presidents, the MPs, and realize that all the matters of human rights, they are not only concerned by women. So the crisis, it is, they are Claudia, a chance for rebirth, for opportunities, because I strongly believe that all the problems they are brought to the surface now, it is our main task as legislators, as the presidents of the House, to be in front and take the initiatives, stand in front of everybody and give a clear and a crystal political message that we will not leave the society as it is and we are not going to spend another 200 years until we will succeed the uh, equality. So it is in our hand to give the right direction. Thank you. We are not patient anymore. Yes. <laughs> Muchas gracias. Eh, realmente, I agree with all my colleagues here. The, the main point is education. That's the main pillar for women. Education for women. In Central America and the Dominican Republic, we're fighting against um, early pregnancy teenage pregnancy, girls of 13, 14, 15 years are having babies. And we have legislated, but it's not enough to just have legislation in parliament. The main point, the fundamental point here is education, because the more educated we are, we women are, the better opportunities we will have. That's why I think that as well as legislating uh, on so many issues for but in order to be able to protect us as women, we also need to implement policies, clear, direct policies for women's education. And that is how we will manage to have, we will succeed in having better rights. Thank you. Very interesting um, debate. Um, I think we have to, we have to um, take another week. <laughs> to continue and discuss all those issues. But it's uh, very important to start with 
and to make it visible. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. The panelists, please put on your microphones. We're just equipping them with yes, the microphone. Yeah, yeah. And um, if you want to say that again, apparently okay. there's not engagement enough on just okay. the presentation. Yes, yeah. I, I'm uh, yeah. Them. Okay. okay, thank you. I think we're, we're fine. We're fine, yes. We'll shorten the Okay. Okay. Well, so we have. Uh, Dear colleagues, in the meantime, while uh, the microphones are equipped, um, I just want to remind you on our social media, uh, please join the conversation by hashtag 13SVSP. Hello, nice to meet you. Yes, Thank nice you very you. much. I stick to the... I'm fed up. <laughs> you know, you know each other Good very to well. See you. <laughs> <laughs> Two second women and third woman of president. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so. And so have we just. 
Nein, das ist nicht meines. Hier, da ist noch eines, das weggeht, das ist meines. Nein, das ist nicht meines, das ist meines. Yes. Yes. <laughs> But it's 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 good to have. Yes. yes. Welcome, please Thank take you. a seat. Do you have headphones? No, the headphones. Oh, oh yes. Okay. So, dear speakers, dear presidents of parliament, we come to our last motion. And this is a very irritating and wide area, violence against girls and women. Wild field because violence shows itself in many different, very ugly grimaces, from domestic violence to femicide, from humanitarian trafficking to female genital mutilation. The third motion is, by 2030, we try it again with 2030, violence against women and girls and harmful practices such as child marriage and female genital mutilation will have disappeared. To debate on this topic, I'm pleased to have with us Ms. Jirin Shamrin Shothari, the Speaker of Parliament of Bangladesh. And Ms. Maybel Chinomona, the President of the Senate of Zimbabwe. They will speak, welcome, they will speak against the motion. And we have Mrs. Margareta Sederfeld, the President of the Parliamentary Assembly of the OEC, of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in, in Europe, who will speak in favor of uh, the motion. So thank you all three for being here with us. Let me start with you, Madame Chaudhuri, please. If you want, if you wish, yes. Good afternoon. Warm greetings from Bangladesh Parliament. It is indeed a great honor to join the 13th Summit of Women Speakers of Parliament and take part in the debate, Motion 3, quote, by 2030, violence against women and girls and harmful practices such as child marriage and female genital mutilation will have disappeared, unquote. I thank IPU and the Parliament of Republic of Austria for this well-arranged event in the beautiful city of Vienna. I will be speaking against the motion this afternoon. Year 2030 is not even a decade away. It is knocking at the door. This gives us very little time to achieve the rather overambitious goals set out in today's motion, dealing with century-old persisting problem, violence against women. Violence against women is a long-drawn complex issue impeding the progress of women empowerment and gender equality. It is embedded in a multiple factors, deep-seated stereotype mindset and thinking pattern, set perceptions and notions, 
conventions, customs, norms, practices, prejudicing women and girls, socioeconomic and cultural factors, gender-based discrimination, and many more. Bringing about positive changes will require educating and empowering women and girls, adopting innovative and proactive policies and legislation. It needs more women representation and more women leaders in different sectors for impactful change. But what do we see? What is the ground reality? The ground reality is quite different. And that is why I say the goal is not achievable by 2030. At global level, only 25% representation of women parliamentarians, even in the light of reserve seats for women. And there are many more quota and reserve provision for women in different sectors, but still we are not being able to ensure parity yet. While 70% women work in health sector, only 25% are in leadership position. Political parties often committing to have 33% representation of women within a certain time frame do not comply with their commitment. On top of that, daunting challenges have arisen due to COVID-19. We need to adopt important strategic and recovery plans to deal with that. COVID-19 poses disproportionate burden on women by reinforcing pre-existing inequalities and deepening gender-based violence on women and girls. This requires focus, attention, and innovative steps to deal with the differentiated impacts of pandemic. Child marriage, for instance, there are legislations to restrain child marriage in many countries of the world, but still we see that it continues. It is more because it is deep-seated and we need to encourage the work of a girl child within the family framework, within the society, in order to put a restraint on child marriage. So legislation alone is not being able to deal with it. Unless we increase women representation in all spheres, public, private, unless we allow women to climb up the ladder to have leadership positions, unless we bring about policy and legislative changes through gender lens and perspective, create awareness and educated all, including men, against stereotype thinking, economically empower women and educate girls at a much faster pace to get there by 2030. But I don't want to sound pessimistic. We cannot take forever to achieve the goal, nor can we give up. Violence against women is grave violation of human rights. Violation against, violence against women cannot be allowed to continue. Violence against women must stop and must stop now. Thank, thank you very much. We must therefore choose to challenge gender inequality as a movement, attracting wider audience. And as we celebrate Beijing Plus 25, we have to work together to achieve the goal and free women being subjected to such violence. I would like to conclude with a quote from British Premier Margaret Thatcher, former Premier. You may have to fight a battle more than once to win it. Let us continue our endeavor in achieving an equal future for all. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Uh, Inumana, please, you have the floor. Please think of the three minutes. Thank you. Madam Moderator, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, without drastic cultural change, political and economic empowerment, women will continue to suffer violations in communities be beyond 2030. Violence against women and girls is a real challenge, firmly rooted in social and cultural factors as well as in political and economic inequalities. To end this violence, we need to break patriarch and end the culture of silence. Cultural change is a slow process. Who 
2021 data indicates that one in three women globally are subjected to physical or sexual violence, a number that has remained unchanged over the past decades. Therefore, the 2030 target cannot be realized. Women living in poverty are more vulnerable to violence, hence the need for economic empowerment. There remains two main barriers, including lack of funding, weak financial inclusion, illiteracy, among other things. In addition, burden of unpaid household chores limit women's participation in the national economy on equal footing with men. The COVID-19 crisis has further increased the pre-existing burden of unpaid work on women. Women are underrepresented in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics STEM, representing only 35% of the world's STEM graduates in 2020. With less than 10 years until 2030, it will provide impossible for many countries to address this gap. Without inclus inclusion of women in STEM, their vulnerability to abuse will remain unabated. To be protected from violence, women political empowerment is necessary. Since Beijing 25 years ago, women's representation in parliament has increased by merely 10%. At this rate, it would take 50 years to achieve gender parity in most countries. Political parties are themselves deeply patriarch patriarchal, male-dominated entities that have been slow to transform without unwavering political commitment. It is highly likely that women political empowerment will remain unfulfilled beyond 2030. Therefore, without political power, women will be subject to manipulation and exploitation. According to recent UNICEF reports, some 650 million girls and women around the world today have been married as children, and over 200 million have been subjected to female genital mutilation. Eliminating child marriages takes, among other things, addressing poverty, cultural and religious beliefs, and inequalities. Persisting inherent challenges include weak reporting systems of forced and child marriages, funding to provide effective pre prevention and related response services. As part of gender response budgeting, has not been institutionalized in most countries. This will unlikely be achieved by 2030. Zimbabwe has had its own share of challenges relating to violence against women and harmful cultural pra practice. To address some of these challenges, the new marriages bill currently before parliament seeks to synchronize marriage laws and ban marriage of uh, anyone below 18 years of age. Our government has always been committed to ending violence against women through enactment of various pieces of legislation and establishment of various structures such as the National Gender-Based Violence Strategy 2012-2015 and the Anti-Domestic Violence Council. The 2030 target remains unrealistic to achieve because what we are witnessing is that it is not only legislation and the structures that will lead to societies free of violence against women, but issues embedded within cultures and patriarchal system that have to be addressed. Change of that magnitude does not take 10 years, it takes generations. Please. Think, to, think of the time, please. To this end, parliaments are called upon to continue being part of the identification of solutions among us to them, enactment of new laws whilst strengthening existing ones that criminalize and punish violence against women, cause drafting of policies on a reporting, data gathering, and also facilitate an intersectional approach to reaching groups most marginalized in countries. I thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We come to our last speaker, Madame Sederfeld. Thank you, Madame Moderator. 
distinguished speakers, members of parliament, ladies and gentlemen. A few weeks ago, the world watched in horror when the Taliban walked in in Kabul. I mention this because Afghanistan is an obs have a server status to OSCE. Countries around uh, Afghanistan are members of OSCE. We saw a horrid image of men, women, children risking their lives to escape an oppressive regime. The regime of the Taliban is synonymous with violence and the oppression of women. Under their regime, women have been subject to harm practice and relegated to mere objects. Yet over the past 20 years, Afghan women have made great contribution to rebuilding a state and a more equal society. They have been medical doctors, teachers, artists, journalists, politicians, and judges. And now all of us have seen scenes from the TV, from reports where kids, young women are saying they will not have the possibility to study. And this might affect Afghanistan for the future, as well as the rest of the world, because no country is alone. They are all related to each other in some way. And this also gives us as politicians and you as speakers a very important role, because we can have an impact. All of us who are in this room, we can speak out, use the public debate. This is very important to not be quiet, to act. But also, as said earlier, to make laws, but not stop with that. Also follow up and request and demand implementation. Of course, end early ma marriage is another topic. If a woman is not possible to earn, ma earn an income, how, to, how should she survive? It's marriage. And sometimes the parents give away the girls instead of sending them to school. This is what we have to fight for, to stop. We should also, as politicians and you as speakers, demand statistics, follow-ups, transparency, not let any violence against women hang behind the closed doors. What I also would like to mention, one of the, the introduction remarks in the first session was given by the OSCE Special Representative on Gender, Dr. Heidi Fry, and she hi highlights uh, the growing crisis of violence against women journalists as well as politicians. And this is, of course, related to increased level of violence where we have observed also in the society as a whole. And we have, as I said, to stop it. And not only to say it, we as politicians can do this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we'll see if there is a comment from the floor. This is not the case. So um, I think uh, we, we had some important points now. We had... Uh, we had uh, the assumption that we have too little time to, to reach this goal in 2030. But on the other hand, we know if it's some more years later, we, we just have to carry on. We just have to be, um, we have to fight. We don't have to stop. We have to be stop being patient. We need transparency, that's what you said. We need um, 
the media, and there we, I just want, want also to mention the tragedy that we, that we see now in Afghanistan. So the media and journalists who help us to be transparent, we need, for this transparency, we need uh, statistics, and we need to make people aware what it is all about. And this is so important. We make people, we make, have to make people in our constituencies being aware what is going on and how the situation is in reality. And we have to show the statistics. And we have to create something like, um, like a field where we do not allow violence against women anymore. And of course, we all would like to have it in 2030. And the sooner, the better. Um, I think the hope that you gave us, Madame Sederfeld, was um, to keep on fighting. And I think we all do this. So um, we come to an end of this session, if there are no more remarks. You want to have some remarks here on the panel? No. It's OK. You want to say something? Yes, please. Yes, I could. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, and what I would like to say, of course, parliamentarians can't change the word ourselves. There needs also to be cooperation with experts, with, with society, because the more, the higher level of engagement, it will be drop off in the society. It will lead to a change. But as politicians, as speakers, as government, there need to be the leadership and a lot of uh, engagement. But what I also would like to say is that I see this meeting as very important with women as speakers of parliament. It's also a leading star for other women to look up to. And I remember when I was a member of OECE PA and uh, Christine. It, yes, <laughs> Christine Muttonen was president. And this means that you were a model for me to look up to. And I think if young women could have other women to look up to and know that if we manage, I can also do it. So you have been a very important woman in OEC, not only as president, but also as a model for others. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, dear participants, uh, dear speakers, Thank you very much for these fruitful and very inspiring discussions we had now and we had the whole day. Um, there is still a lot to do, but we won't give up. I don't think we won't give up. We are all here very inspired. And I just want to thank you very much for your participation and for your fight. It's not just for us, it's for our daughters and our granddaughters, and it's for the girls and boys, because I think only together, men and women can change the world, but we give the kick to change the world. So thank you very much. And now I give over the floor to our chair of the whole session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Ms. Matson, for your inspiring uh, way of moderating these uh, two sessions. Thank, thank you, you so much. And thank you to all who have contributed to the, to the discussions. It's been, it's been an important day. Uh, and we need more time to talk. But we will take that time and we will meet again, right? Now we will actually meet again in five minutes. Uh, I will say that we will have a short coffee break. Only five minutes, and then we will be back here for the closing session. So 
uh, have a small coffee break, and I'll see you back in five minutes, 15.45. Thank you.
Hello. Okay. Oh, no, no. <laughs> okay. Fellow speakers, women speakers, shall we start the um, the closing session? Yes, we should, right? Yes. Okay. Welcome back. We've really had a productive day um, of interactive debates. We've heard the thoughts and perspectives of women speakers from all over the world. And before we um, move to our closing session, I want us to hear a message, a spoken message from the Senate of Uzbekistan. And the message is in Russian. So you might prefer to take on your your uh, translation gear, yes. <laughs> okay, so then we are ready for the, uh, for the spoken message from the Senate of Uzbekistan. Thank you. Dear Madam Chair, dear speakers of parliaments, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome all of you to today's 13th summit which is dedicated to this extremely important topic. I would like to express my gratitude to the Austrian Parliament and the government, the Secretariat and the leadership of the Interparliamentary Union for this excellent organization of our meeting in the hospitable city of Vienna. The summit demonstrates the growing authority of women in state in world politics, their high role in solving pressing problems both at the national and international levels. This was evident during the period of pandemics, which disrupted the way people around the world lived. All countries are learning to live in new conditions. Women, mothers, wives, and mentors, heads of states, leaders and members of governments and parliaments are successfully involved in the implementation of tasks aimed at mitigating the social economic consequences of the epidemic. Many of them are at the forefront of providing assistance to the population. They are actively involved in the organization of medical services, social welfare services, humanitarian actions, and make a significant contribution to the containment of the pandemic as well as to the further recovery of our economic development. I would like especially stress the importance of on stimulation and creating the necessary conditions for healthcare, healthcare professionals who have earned our sincere gratitude for their actions. For example, health workers in Uzbekistan have found successful methods of treating the coronavirus, containing it in the early stages. In this regard, our country in our country, we observe the highest rates of patients cured of COVID-19. At the same time, doctors, nurses are provided with all personal protective equipment. Their salaries are increased. 
it is important that women are equally represented in decision-making positions and have the necessary decision-making powers. We are all well aware of one simple truth that women, especially in crisis, manage social economic processes even more efficiently, effectively. In Uzbekistan, women in decision-making positions are actively involved in preserving the achievements and contribution to the country's further progress. They are women deputies, parliamentarians, ministers, mayors of cities, even bankers, heads of more than 400 NGOs dealing with women's issues and rights. According to the 2021 UN and IPU Women in Policies ranking, Uzbekistan ranks 45th in terms of women's representation at the highest level of government. This is undoubtedly the result of the state policy pursued by the president of Uzbekistan, which finds a positive response and is highly appreciated by the public. An example of the recognition of our achievements is the fact that the head of the Senate of the Parliament of Uzbekistan was elected chairman of the Dialogue of Women Leaders of the Central Asia countries. Based on our experience in enhancing women's contribution to daily life, we invite you to the next 14th Summit of Women Leaders of Parliaments, which we plan to organi organize in Uzbekistan in 2022. Dear participants, I hope that a result, as a result of today's summit, our recommendations aimed at strengthening gender equality will be developed and will be useful for all of us. I wish you fruitful work, success and good health. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Um, thank you, um, all of you who took part in the two sessions of exciting debates. Uh, all of your interventions coming from various perspectives are a valuable contribution to the overall deliberations of today's summit. During the first session, Women in the Pandemic, a tribute to everyday heroes, we heard interesting discussions from fellow speakers of parliament on how women are indeed the true heroes of the fight against the pandemic and the importance of guaranteeing that women are also an equal strength in levels of decision making. We heard views on the provision of financial support for domestic care work while ensuring that women remain in the workforce through a more equal division of care work. We listened to discussions on the need for universal gender responsive social protection systems that must be addressed through legislation and changing our societal expectations of women and the family. During, during the second session, women in the post-pandemic recovery, preserving achievements, furthering progress, the debates centered around what we need to do by 2030 to achieve our shared goals. We discussed the strong need for gender parity in parliaments towards creating the policies that can achieve global economic recovery post-pandemic. We also shared how we can work towards the eradication of violence against women and girls in all forms. The pandemic brought us new challenges, such as global inequities in vaccines and access to medical support. However, it also gave us new opportunities and women in power are showing the way on so many fronts. This debate reinforced that having gender responsive legal reforms and economic policies that recognize women's unique work should not be separate from COVID-19 recovery, but must be integral to it. And that for building back better, we need to build back more equal. And speaking about challenges, as our fellow speaker from Cyprus emphasized in her remarks, we must stand up for women and girls' rights in Afghanistan. Sadly, Ms. Favza Kofi did not arrive in time for today's summit, but we look forward to hearing her tomorrow. Uh, the Afghan girls and women rely on our support in these difficult times. 
As I mentioned, today's discussion will inform and contribute to the deliberations of the Fifth World Conference of Speakers of Parliament starting tomorrow. Making gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls a priority on the global parliamentary agenda is urgently needed now more than ever. I would like to end by calling on each and every one of us to act now and to act together. We need to seize this opportunity to take bold, sustainable action for a gender equal tomorrow. Side by side, our parliaments can inspire the change we wish to see in our societies. And then I would like to call uh, on Mr. Harald Dossi, the Secretary General of the Austrian Parliament, to deliver his closing remarks. So, Mr. Dossi, the floor is yours. Sehr geehrte Parlamentspräsidentinnen, Dear speakers, women speakers of parliament, parliament, Madam President, Secretary General, ladies and general, as the Secretary General of the Austrian Parliament, I would also like to give you my deepest thanks for your participation and for the fact that you came to Vienna. I know that it is not to be taken for granted the fact that we were able to meet together in person and discuss matters. The conscientious security and safety measures that we've all taken, and I'm sure some of you find those safety measures rather uh, cumbersome, they are unfortunately required in order to ensure that we have a safe summit. And I'm sure that I don't even, I'm sure that I can assume to have your comprehension for that. It is really the fact that we're meeting in person that makes this so important to have the encounters between parliamentarians from different countries to be able to talk about these different issues from different perspectives. And we need to be able to look at these issues holistically as well. It is an important condition that we also, as parliamentary decision makers, we be, are able to meet the challenges and rise to them on behalf of our citizens. Today is another telling example of the challenges we face today with COVID-19, climate change, um, national and international conflicts, migration, and that's just to name a few. And beyond all of these challenges, and within all of these challenges, the roles of women and girls are of great, of great importance. That's why we have been having these discussions. When we, if we do not take gender into consideration, then, then we will worsen our current uh, inequalities and create new ones. Fra women are an essential part of a sustainable security structure. And that is why it is especially important that you as women in the highest offices in parliament, that you have a voice in the parliamentary agenda and that you are able to, able to come up with gender responsive solutions to the economic and social problems that we face. The conclusions that we've drawn today will come out in the outcomes in our, uh, will influence the outcomes of the conference tomorrow. You are, we are interested in making this a priority on the agenda for all parliaments. And that being said, ladies and gentlemen, I would really like to say thank you for your important contributions today. And I would like to wish you a more fruitful discussions tomorrow at the Fifth World Conference of Speakers of Parliament. Finally, I would also like to 
express my deepest thanks to the employees of the IPU, Mr. Chunggang at the head, Philip and his team, and then of course my colleagues in the in the leadership of the Austrian Parliament. Um, I would like to express my deep thanks to you for your organization. I would like to wish you all a great afternoon and evening in Vienna, and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your remarks, Mr. Doss, and thank you for hosting us in this beautiful city. For the final words, I invite Mr. Martin Shungong, the Secretary General of the Interparliamentary Union, to give his closing message. The floor is yours. Uh, th <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Speaker Troin. Tony, thank you, uh, Chair of uh, this uh, very important uh, summit. Uh, honorable uh, Speakers of Parliament still present here, uh, I know that uh, you have lo lots of demands on your time, and uh, the fact that you are staying here up until this late hour uh, today is evidence of the importance that you grant to uh, female leadership in today's world. So it gives me extreme pleasure to be able to say a few words during this closing uh, session of your summit. I have seen the number of men who have preceded me to this podium. And I think that this symbolizes what Speaker Sobotka was saying this morning that we need a behavioral transformation. Men should feel duty bound to continue to work together with their female colleagues to effect the change that we need in society and bring about gender equality and also to fight against violence against women. So it gives me pleasure, uh, dear colleague uh, Harold, to be here with you to show that the men are also with you uh, female leaders to work toward that beneficial change that we want. I have been on and off in this room and I have heard a lot of interesting things that have been said. Interesting not because uh, they make us laugh or anything, but because I think it is important. It is evidence of the importance that we attach to the issues that are on the global agenda. Uh, the fact that women leaders can make a change. As I say, we have heard a lot about what women are doing and have been doing in the global effort to stem the pandemic. It has been impressive to hear those sacrifices that women have been making, the burdens that they've assumed in order to make sure that the world doesn't go down with the uh, pandemic. We have heard you discuss efforts to ensure the a gender responsive economic recovery and there you have talked about fair compensation and equal division of domestic work between men and, and women. And they need to come up, as you said, uh, Speaker Truin, they need to come up with universal social protection systems that cater equitably to men and uh, women. From the policy level, we've had examples that you have given of what is happening in many countries, the progress that has been made, the provision of financial support to families for childcare based on the number of children, early retirement for women who have children with disabilities, mental health hotlines that support children and adolescents as they bounce back from the pandemic. And of course, policies that increase women's participation in decision-making, which ultimately improve the quality of legislation. I think there is no doubt, as has been mentioned, that when women are involved effectively in decision-making and in fashioning legislation, we come out with more effective outcomes. Speaker Trun, you talked about building back better. And this means building back better, including addressing in a fair and equitable manner the differential needs of men and women. 
The pandemic has exposed us to some of the flaws in our society. And we, as we move towards the COVID-19 recovery, we need to ensure that there are stronger policies that are in place and can fill in the gaps. And it is your role as the parliamentary leadership to show the way for recovering in a better uh, fashion. We count on your unflinching support in this regard. As has been said, your deliberations today will feed into the conference of speakers of parliaments that is to begin uh, tomorrow for the next uh, two days. And we think that the, what you have said today is a befitting tribute to the role of parliamentary leadership, both men and women, in addressing the challenges of our time. And it's appropriately so, as the title of your conference has to deal with parliamentary uh, leadership. So we are looking forward to uh, transforming your deliberations into actionable uh, outcomes that we can, uh, as the IPU, uh, promote as uh, we move forward in helping to build a, a better world. We are confronted with a global problem, so we must approach the problem through the global lens. And this means that multilateralism will continue to be relevant and unavoidable. We have to work together to build a society of uh, solidarity in addressing the concerns that uh, challenge all of us. And it has been said it is by working together that we can achieve uh, better outcomes. I want also to use this opportunity to echo the concerns that have been expressed by many of you regarding the dire situation in Afghanistan. This is something that has just happened in the recent uh, past, but we are all fully aware of the very difficult circumstances that the Afghan people, including and especially women, are going through. We have a special thought for them today, and as you said, Speaker Trone, tomorrow we'll have the opportunity of hearing from somebody who has just come out of the quagmire of Afghanistan. And we can then see in real life what it is that the Afghan woman is going through under the circumstances. But I also have special thoughts for those countries that have so graciously accepted to take in, take in uh, helpless Afghan nationals, including members of uh, parliament. As I speak, I am reminded of the plea that the Ugandan uh, delegation has made there are small countries like Uganda that are also harboring refugees from Afghanistan, and they need all our support, they need all our solidarity in order to give them the resources and the capacity to manage these uh, refugee flows. So that is my appeal to this uh, conference, that we look at those big countries that are providing support, but also the smaller countries that in their own modest way are helping to alleviate the suffering of uh, the Afghan people. With that, Madam Chair, let me just conclude by saying thank you for so graciously chairing this summit. You have been with us at the very beginning. You chaired all the preparatory committees of the Women Speakers Conference, in addition to being a member of the preparatory committee of uh, the uh, Conference of Speakers itself. Thank you very much for your ongoing support. We look forward to working with you. But let me also say thank you to our hosts, represented here by my colleague, uh, Harold Dorsey. They have been working night and day over the past uh, several months since we mooted the idea of having this, the conference in uh, Vienna. And uh, I am very grateful to you for the support that we have received throughout uh, the preparatory process. And I'm sure that the next few days will prove the point that when we put our hands together, we can achieve great outcomes. Thank you very much, all of you, for being here today with us, and we look forward to the deliberations tomorrow and the day after. Thank you very much.
So thank you so much, uh, Mr. Shongang, for those inspiring words, and thank you for well organizing and arranging this in such a perfect uh, manner to you and your secretariat, and also, of course, to to the Austrian hosts. Okay, colleagues, this concludes the our 13th summit of Women Speakers of Parliament. Thank you to all the participants who joined us today and helped make this event a success. Please do not forget that a performance of the Opera Tosca at the Vienna Opera House organized by the Austrian Parliament will be held at 7.30 p.m. this evening for our women speakers and one accompanying person. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow as well for the fifth World Conference of Speakers. And have a good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for today.